Council. <laughs> Call this meeting of the Salem Housing Authority to order. So if the recorder the would please call down. the roll. <coughs> Commissioner Tesler? Present. Commissioner Nanke? Here. Commissioner Clausen? Here. Commissioner Dickey? Here. Commissioner Rogers? Here. Commissioner Benares? Here. Commissioner Clem? Here. Commissioner Hine is absent. Chair Bennett? Here. If you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to take uh, just a moment and uh, deviate from our regular agenda. Madam Mayor, would you like to join us? We have a special recognition this evening. Thank you. Hello. Nine, nine years, right? <laughs> and is moving to sunnier climes, although you can't get better weather. We tried to get good weather here this week, Kathy, so that you might change your mind. We sincerely thank you, Kathy, for all of your hard work, for your dedication, for your absolute welcoming to every person who comes into City Hall and every person who comes to talk to you about filing as a candidate. Every one of us here went through that process and not knowing sometimes what to do, there was Kathy with all of the right answers and all of the help and the guidance always. And I know that you've treated everyone with that same respect and that same help. You have really created a tremendous uh, template here for the way a recorder treats the public and the way the recorder treats the, the city and the staff and the good care that you give to all of the legal proceedings that you're involved in. We have a little something for you from our council. This is for you. And I'm sure that also our city manager would like to say a few words. Of course. Well, you know, the city recorder is a position that we rely on so heavily in the organization, both from the process of running elections smoothly, from responding to public information requests, to um, documenting and codifying all of the ordinance changes we make, and archiving all of our documents. And I think that's only probably a fourth <laughs> of what Kathy's been doing. She's done um, an excellent job the whole time Kathy's been here. And we're going to miss her tremendously. And we all just want to thank you so much, Kathy, for feedback. Yes. Let's give, Kathy, let's give Kathy the microphone. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with uh, each mayor and council member um, for the city of Salem. And uh, I, I don't like speeches. <laughs> <laughs> I can sit up there and be behind the microphone that I'm comfortable with and and say, excuse me, Madam Mayor, but um, this, is, this is really a very special surprise, and thank you so much. I, I really have enjoyed all of you, so. And we, you. very welcome. You may open it whenever you're ready. <laughs> whenever you're ready. It, it's not on the agenda, so of course we don't have to follow the rules. And there is cake also yes. up at the side of the room. Thank, Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. And the cake is over here in the back, and everyone in the council chambers is welcome to have a piece as um, you would wish. Thank you. Well, I'll go back to the script that uh, Kathy supplies us each week to keep this thing rolling. Um, she also does all of our agendas and uh, changes them and helps us keep them right up to date to the moment we come in here. Really uh, constantly appreciated. 
Uh, this is the point on the Housing Authority agenda for the public to comment. I have no one signed up. Would anyone like to address the Housing no. Authority? All right. <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Nanke, if you could uh, give us the consent agenda with Councillor Rogers pulling 3.3A. So moved. Second. Any discussion? If I may, and I'd spoken to uh, Mr. Wilch prior to the meeting as well on uh, 3.2A, the resolution regarding the, uh, the new rules. Um, if I get to the front, then I'm going to miss my other piece. The revisions to admissions and continued occupancy policy for public housing. There's a... Uh, a statement in the changes that specifies, um, and let me just get back to it here. Um, we'll set a f the flat rental amount for each public housing unit that complies with the requirement that all flat rents, rents be set at no less than 80% of the applicable fair market rent adjusted if necessary to account for reasonable utility cost. And the question was is what is that utilities uh, element and it applied across the board and, and yes commissioner it is it's uh, something that the housing authority calculates each year HUD approves and it uh, the utility allowance is um, staggered based upon the size of the unit the number of bedrooms and the occupancy so it, it would actually always be necessary at some level yes that's correct. okay thank you we'll always deduct the the um, I was gonna say UA um, uh, the uh, utility allowance um, from the maximum amount of money that the client can pay for their housing. So the UA comes off their income. Excellent, thanks. All right, any further questions? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, motion passes. Commissioner Rogers, 3.3A. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we have an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Salem for administrative services for the Housing Authority. Second. Second by Bernard. Clem. <clears throat> oh, Clem. You guys start sounding alike with your mouth full of cake. <laughs> 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 ah, okay. So, Mr. Council Chairman, Clem seconded. Yes, I, I pulled it because I had a question about uh, <clears throat> the city providing services for another governmental agency, and I just wanted to have a clearer understanding of whether the agency has uh, solicited other uh, opportunities to provide the same services. And I think when I'm all done, I would come back to the city and ask the question: Are we? How do we justify the dollars that we're that we're doing this contract for? So. Uh, Andy. Yes, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, we had a chance to talk this afternoon, and I, uh, my answer, a short answer is yes, we've looked in a couple areas, um, fleet and payroll, to see if there was some open market opportunities for us that might provide cost savings for the agency. And at a high level, um, there are services in the private sector that could, say, provide payroll, and certainly. Uh, you can get an oil change at Oil Can Henry and other things like that. But when you get into a more comprehensive work that the city does for us on the payroll front and the tax front, we really can't buy that in the market. And I think that's the same thing for the fleet, too. Um, the fleet work we get is comprehensive, and they're taking care of our vehicles, and we value that uh, it, as a relationship. And so the short of it is I, I haven't found anything that makes more financial sense than staying where we are on those two particular issues. Thank you. And my follow-up is, is maybe it's not fair because I didn't ask staff earlier, but how do we justify those costs when we're looking at this report? And, and um, you know, I, I looked at the budget, and I see where if I read the budget properly, uh, I show the revenue from this coming in at a lower amount, which is fine. We'll make more money on them. But I just wonder how do we justify that we're charging the right amount? 
We've, um, since we started doing this, we keep track of our costs so that we have um, our best estimate of what we anticipate for the next year's budget year. And of course, like any other revenue, then we keep track of costs as we go through the year, and if there needs to be some adjustment, we make that. So it's, it's our estimate based on what services uh, we anticipate providing and have been provided in past years. So in the budget, it shows 28,000 some odd right. dollars, and this is 30,000, so we're gonna make a little money, is that where we're at? Yeah, there, there can be more revenue if we end up providing that level of service okay. to the housing authority. Plus for the other services, like legal, and those That's are right. over and above. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions or discussion on this motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Commissioner Nanke on 4.A. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move a uh, staff recommendation uh, in regards to adoption of the fiscal 2014-15 operating budgets and budget certification. Second. Second by Tesler. Any discussion, questions? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Motion passes. We have no further business. The Housing Authority is adjourned. I'm going to call to order and, be, and open the um, Urban Renewal Agency meeting for Monday, September 8th, 2014. Would the recorder please call the roll? Yes. Board Member Bennett? Here. Board Member Tesler? Present. Board Member Nanke? Here. Board Member Claussen? Here. Board Member Dickey? Here. Board Member Rogers? Here. Board Member Benares? Here. Board Member Clem? Here. Chair Peterson? Here. Thank you. I don't believe we have any reports from boards, commissions, or committees this evening, but we do have time now for public comment 
for any item, agenda item uh, for the Urban Renewal Agency. Is there anyone here who wish to make comment? I think we have a sign-up sheet. Okay. And we do. Daniel Dolan, is Mr. Dolan here? Welcome, Mr. Dolan. You have three minutes. At the end of two minutes, the amber light comes on, and at the end of the three minutes, the red light comes on. If you'll just state your name and address for the record. Thank you. My name is Daniel Dolan. I'm a resident of West Salem. I thank you for this opportunity to speak, and I'd like to address agenda item uh, 4.3A. Uh, today, Statesman Journal had an article concerning a surprise pipeline that was discovered on the uh, Boise Cascade property uh, quite recently. Apparently, this pipeline was not discovered uh, during a number of other environmental investigations. The question that I have for the council is how and by what process did the, does uh, obtaining an environmental clearance on this property uh, become a responsibility of the city of Salem? Uh, according to this article, if it's accurate, this pipeline is not on city-owned property, and it is not on property that the city intends to purchase. So the question I have is why should $200,000 of city funds be appropriated for, uh, for this issue? I realize it's a problem. It's certainly a problem for Mountain West. It may be a problem for the Department of uh, Environmental Quality or the EPA or even Boise Cascade, which uh, still has a corporate presence in the state. But I don't see that it's a problem for the city. That concludes my remarks. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming down and, and asking a question as pertinent as that one. Are there questions from any counselors for Mr. Dolan? All right, thank you very much. Was there anyone else in the chambers who wished to speak at this time? And uh, Mayor, if I can, yes. I believe um, that item may be pulled and then staff has a response to the question that Mr. Dolan asked. Right, so I think you'll, you'll hear something in just a minute. Okay, good. Um, seeing no, uh, hearing no further public comment, we'll move to the consent calendar. Uh, <coughs> Member Bennett, do you have a motion? Yes, Madam Mayor, I move the consent calendar uh, with the following poll, 4.3A by uh, Councilor Rogers. Second. Thank you. It's been moved by Member Bennett and seconded by Member Benars to um, move the consent calendar and adopt the consent calendar with the exception of item 4.3A, which is being pulled by Councillor Rogers. And is there discussion on this motion? Seeing none. Yes, Councillor Rogers, do you care to, to discuss at this point? Or I do. do I want to comment, and okay. I probably should have pulled it, and I was going to, and then I didn't. But I just want to comment on the uh, uh, 4.3b. Uh, we were presented with a new member on the uh, NGRAB, North Gateway Redevelopment mm -hmm. Advisory Board, and basically we just had a name and the position. And I, I thought as a, as a counselor voting on somebody to be on a commission that we should have had more information on the report. Yeah. And I hope that that would be forthcoming uh, so we can still have that. I, I feel embarrassed to bring this up because I don't want to uh, make the person that has volunteered to be on the committee feel like we're against them. But I do think that we should have more information if we're going to make those kind of positions. And, and the I, public I, needs to know. I appreciate your comment, and it reminds me as, as chair of that uh, council committee, subcommittee, that uh, we should get that information out. Um, all applicants are reviewed by the committee, and uh, the op application and background um, information supplied by all applicants is available to the committee, and we certainly should put it out. And, and I, I, I recognize that what you're doing tonight is, is questioning a procedural issue, not the person. So that's fine. Thank you. Yes, Councillor uh, Member Tesler. Um, I, I had spoken to Councillor Rogers about this earlier, and then I went and I looked at the packet some more, and it looks like maybe a page wasn't scanned in is what it looks like to me because there's a break 
right after that first page. I think maybe somebody didn't scan the page in right after that because usually there is a page with that information on it. So I'm wondering if that was just a yeah. one of those yeah. type of errors. Um, I my recollection is a year or so ago. Um, we had the direction just to put the statements in and not the full background information. So the last, uh, for probably that period of time, we've only had the statements, as I recall. We're happy to put the uh, resume oh. in as well. And uh, Mr. Duncan, I think you have the information on this applicant. If I do. I can provide yeah. it to others. Uh, the one statement I will make is that is correct. We have gone to uh, a summary of the intent of the applicant. Um, there is some information on their personal cell phone and work phone. Uh, so we would want to make the applicants aware that prior to bringing it to council that their application could be um, a part of the agenda packet and made public uh, at the time of the meeting. And I will make a note that in my council packet, there is a page actually that um, discusses the appointment and, and indicates the person that we're appointing and his, his name is O. Jeff Lewis. And in his statement, he said he feels that he could represent both businesses and residential concerns that um, on any issues that might change their homes or place of business or lifestyle in the Northgate Urban Renewal District. But we will get the entire application out to everybody. Okay. Yes, Councillor Dickey. Thank you, and I appreciate you um, mentioning that. I think one thing that is helpful to that just kind of applies to you know all the boards and commissions that we appoint to is the specific position the person is filling, because we have on some of our boards we have residency requirements, we have particular. Um, I know in, in the the North Gateway area, there are, you know we have sometimes it's a business owner, sometimes it's a resident. So just just to just for information, which position would this person be filling? And if it said that, I apologize that I missed it. We'll make sure that's in. Um, in this case, it says there is one vacancy to represent the interests of small and large businesses, property owners, and others with financial or occupational interests within the North Gateway Urban Renewal Area. So good point. Good point. Okay, uh, are we ready to vote on the motion? I believe that's on the floor is to um, adopt the consent calendar with the exception of the one poll 4.3A. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank <coughs> you. All right, we will move to the information uh, reports and you know, just draw your attention to three reports that are in your packet. And now we'll move to special orders of business where we will actually consider item 4.3A. Councillor Rogers, would you like to speak to your poll on that item? Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. To put it on the table, I'll <coughs> move that we approve the grant agreement attached to the staff report to provide $170,000 of riverfront downtown and $30,000 of south waterfront urban renewal area funds, the total of $200,000 to the City of Salem for environmental due diligence necessary to acquire 3.8 acres of land adjacent to the riverfront park. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Rogers and seconded by Councillor Benars. Is there discussion on the motion? Thank Councilor you, Rogers? Mayor. <coughs> My big question is, was already uh, <laughs> asked by Mr. Dolan tonight, is uh, why would we as a buyer of a piece of property do the due diligence on an environmental study when it seems like the seller should be taking on that responsibility? John Wales, uh, Urban Development uh, Development Director. Uh, it's a very good question, Councillor. Um, the the process that we're going through is called um, a prospective purchaser's agreement process. It is a process that's offered to buyers of new property um, that uh, by DEQ uh, that offers them protection um, to show one that they have done due diligence on the property, they understand the conditions of the property, but would also be exempt from further uh, liabilities in the future once they step into the chain of title uh, of that. So. The process that we are engaged in um, this PPA process is a is a process that is a a buyer's prerogative. It's not a seller's sellers. They could pay for it, but they typically don't. I've never heard of a developer that wouldn't uh, that would. Um, 
Oh, yeah. Um, the PPA is discretionary. We aren't required to, 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 um, to go through that process. It's the city's choice to do that. It has some upfront costs um, that the city has agreed as part of our due diligence to pay for. And um, until we decide that these costs are no longer in the ar arena that we want to, are interested in this property, we have that obligation under, under our agreement. All right. Um, I see <coughs> Councilor uh, Member Rogers would still have the floor, and then I'll call on uh, Member Benars and then Member Nanke. I guess it seems to me that if we sp spend the dollars to protect us before we purchase the property, mm -hmm. that and we identify some environmental problems that have to be done. I'm thinking brownfield when I say that. And we identify that in our due diligence, and we and we do not buy the property because of that. Do we not set the developer up for the same problem? Now, now they know that they have a problem, and, and DEQ then will hold them accountable today. Uh, that's a good. That's that is true. Um, in properties that are environmentally challenged like this, you need two parties to go into this arena. You have to have a, a owner and a buyer. It's very important in that process to understand what the end use is going to be. So that if, for example, the city wanted to buy this and build condominiums on that property or housing or doing something that we were going to be digging up that soil, we would have one uh, set of agreements with the, with the developer and how all that would work. If in this case, though, we're looking at capping the property and, and using it for a park, as we've done with the rest of Riverfront Park, there would be a different set of agreements uh, that would be incurred. We're, uh, we're going through on this acquisition for the second. We're going through a process where our end use is a park. And so our end pro uh, program will be to cap the site and to um, make it safe and to uh, expand the use of the, the park. So. We are keeping it very limited, very in its in its scope, and so in doing that, we said we want to know everything we can to know about this to make sure that in the future we don't have an obligation or a liability with this. If knowing what the historic use of this property was, that's our request. That's not the developer's requirement. And so as we go forward with this, that's why it's it's our cost, not not theirs, and I, I can answer the other question as well when, when you're ready. Well, I, I, I guess, if I may, Mayor, um, <clears throat> if we, this sounds to me like the issue is not even on the 3.8 acres, and so we're going beyond that piece of property to find something that we don't know is there. So why are we tying it into the park property if it has if it doesn't even touch it and i think that's very similar to the question that was asked earlier and it's an excellent question the pipe that has been discovered is just to the west side of the railroad maybe i could go to the podium yes, and, and please. use a point um the um pipe that has been discovered is located right here along the railroad tracks it actually is in the on the railroad right of way. It's not on the property that is owned by the developer or is owned by the um, by the uh, um, or, or but it was what we're looking to purchase. Uh, what happens here in a prospective purchaser's agreement? Once DEQ, we apply for it. Once DEQ says yes. They request all new information on this site to be turned over to them. That means data that we have or know of, and the develop as well as the developer or anybody else that has done more recent testing. That happened, and when that was turned over to them, DEQ evaluated it and said there is a hot spot at the end of this pipe that we didn't know before. It's not on this, the city property that we're looking at, but the source of that hot spot they believe was on the city property from an old bleach plant that was part of the Boise, um, original Boise development. 
DEQ told us that, okay, we want to make very clear, very certain that that is, still, is not still active. And they wanted, asked us originally to trace the pipe back um, as far as it would go and to look to see if it crossed onto our property and were there still connections to it. We discovered that no, uh, we did a ground penetrating radar, the pipe didn't go much further back, it has been disconnected. It did not reach back onto the property that we're looking to acquire, meaning that it's not connected any longer to where the old bleach plant site was. But because of that, it's not where the, the, the contamination was found or the pipe that's there, it's where was the source that DEQ was looking at. They're interested in what is that source and is it still generating um, a concern. We've pretty much answered the question that we don't think that that particular pipe, um, although there may, is contamination, is still coming from um, the uh, bleach plant, but they are, um, they are concerned enough to say that, okay, we know now that it's, we don't think it's coming here, but we wanna make sure that it's not happening down the slough and out, or down the creek and out into the slough. And that's the area that they're asking for further testing for. And the other reason that um, they're asking for that, and there's a, sec there's a second reason, is that through our due diligence, we've also learned at one point in Boise's history, there was a pipe system that came from the bleach plant, didn't come out this way into the slough, but and went across the park parcel and dumped into the um, material into the slough there. And they're asking, and we agree, that we should know if there's any um, impact um, uh, of contamination in that area. And so the, the testing that's being asked for uh, by DEQ is further testing along the river bank and along the slough, oh, I'm sorry, about the, the slough bank and along Mill, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Pringle <coughs> Creek in this area here. And all of that is to get, fill in gaps in their data and, and ours to understand is there still any leakage or any possibility of um, contamination still coming from this property? And that's the connection. Right, and if I could, Mayor, uh, the reason we want to look at that now is we're in the due diligence process before we purchase the property. Because we don't want the community or the city or the agency to be in the chain of title for any kind of contamination as it goes further. So this is a right time to find out if there is anything. And again, in this case, you know, it may be that one spot and nothing else, we just won't know that. But what we're doing right now is the testing. And then there's a process to determine, you know, who's responsible responsible for the source of the contamination. We went through a similar process. We did a prospective purchaser agreement as um, the agency and council will remember when we purchased uh, the island from Boise because all of this area over decades and decades was used for industrial use and we wanna make sure that um, if there is a problem it gets mitigated and that the right parties are doing the mitigation but we're doing the testing now to make sure we know what's there before we make a decision to purchase. Yes, Member Rogers. This will be my last one, Mayor. Sorry. Right. So a follow up to that is this project or this request is is uh, it, it's bigger than just this piece of property that, w and when you read the report, it sounds like we're voting on it in order to ac acquire this property, which we are, but it's a bigger issue than this piece of property is what I'm hearing. Well, the, um, if you mean that there are other testing sites along the tip of the park, it's because that's the way the water flows and they just wanna make sure that everything is that there aren't other issues. Yeah, but that's our existing park that property that our we own, not property. this parcel that we're talking about purchasing. Right. right. Okay. But again, it comes. It gets back to where's the source of that, yeah. and if the source of that is um, that has the same characteristic as what they found along the railroad, it will be a. It will be in, most likely interpreted by us and DEQ that that source was the bleach plant and that that's a responsibility between DEQ and Boise. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're paying for it is again because it's, you know, we're the ones doing the, the research before we decide whether to purchase a property or not. And I believe it's, um, 
how many of the sites are on city's currently owned property versus not? The, 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 the testing plan that DEQ has asked um, from the city is for 19 test sites. And um, about five of them are located right along Pringle Creek, just, just to, the, to the west of where the, the pipe is. Um, and that's, if you're familiar with that site, there's a large wall there and some riprap that goes down to the creek. There is dirt in that, in that riprap that they're asking us to, and these are, very, these are scoops. These, are, these aren't drilling, this is surface um, conditions that they're asking about. So there are, there are about five of those, and that is in um, South Waterfront URA. And that's why we're asking for the South Waterfront URA funding for that portion of the testing. The other 15 sites, or 14 or 15 sites, are in this area here. Similar types of tests. Um, they'll be surfaced uh, about five out of the 19, I believe, are two feet deep. The rest are right off the surface. That will, will be tested um, uh, for contamination. And uh, we think it's prudent, since we are the current owner of the park, the Riverfront Park, and that we're acquiring this property, that we should know this. We should know this, too. <coughs> Okay, I have um, member Bednars and then member Clem, then member, excuse me, Bednars, <coughs> member Nanke, then Clem. Thank you. The first question I had as is why are we looking off the property that we're purchasing has been answered. The second question I have has is, um, so w once they find something, whose responsibility is it, and financial responsibility is it to remove or mitigate that, that problem if there is something identified that they can get rid of? Well. Where the pipeline currently is, um, Mountain West and the previous property owners, that would be the railroad and Boise and its subsidiaries, whoever they've allocated their liability to, would be responsible for, for, that, for that. In fact, DEQ is requiring that process start, if not be completed, before they will issue us a PPA. They want, they want that done. As far as the sites that we are, the, 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 the riverbank that we're testing, we would attend that that was, um, that was not put there by the city, um, that had been there prior to that, and that we would inform, the, share the information that we collected with DEQ and then share it with Boise. So potentially the city in, might end up footing the bill at the beginning to mitigate these problems, but in the end it's likely that it'll come it, from a different it, source. It's potential. A lot of the sampling they appear to be taking, though, is down um, in, the, in the creek bed. They've asked for the sampling to be done at this time of year when the creek is low, which is below the median high water mark. Um, technically, parts of that, if not all of it, would be in the department, would be the property of the Department of State Lands, um, but we don't know for sure. Um, and and won't know until it's uh, it's completed, um, but yes, that that's a possibility. Is there any expectation at this point that we're going to be going beyond the two hundred thousand dollars? We've already spent what a hundred thousand on this testing. I'm sorry. Haven't we already spent a hundred thousand or about, seventy thousand? About uh, just. 120. 120. Yeah, and, okay, yeah. and not just on testing, but no. um, other consultant services and legal Due diligence services. Issues. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah. If we're spending another 200. My question is are we going to be stuck or we, we mean pulled down, pouring good money after bad, basically? Well, it's, it's, um, it's one of these processes you go into. We don't know what's there. DEQ doesn't know what's there. If we're um, a serious buyer and want this property, we have to weigh that and the council will need to weigh that or the Urban Renewal Board will have to weigh that as, as an investment you're willing to make or not. And that's really the, the dynamic of, of what this is tonight is whether you want the, te the testing to continue and the, the prospective purchaser's, purchaser agreement to, to continue. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Member Nanke. My question's already been answered, thank you. All right, Member Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, John, just want to clarify that um, the property that we are looking to buy mm -hmm. um, could be the source mm -hmm. or not of contamination that's been found in off other, the property we want other buy. areas. Yeah. And 15 of the 19 or 14 of the 19 test sites are on property that the city already owns. That's correct. Thank you. That's because it's down gradient. All right, are there any further questions? Yes, Member Rogers. Urban renewal funds are capital expenditures. Is this considered a capital expenditure? 
Uh, is this a capital expenditure? It's, it's both of these are, 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 this testing is considered projects in both of our URA plans for development. And those are, those are projects that are allowed in our urban, both of these urban renewal areas. Member Bednars. Uh, I have no idea what level of contaminant is safe or not, but is, is, is this an area that should be walled off or chained off so that other people can't get to it, or is that that kind of concern level? Well, we, can, we know that the area where the pipe is up by the railroad tracks is fenced off and that's secure from the public, and, they, and uh, the DEQ has asked for the immediately to take for uh, Mountain West and the, the railroad and Boise to take care of that. Um, we don't know yet about, um, uh, about Riverfront Park. Although we do think we know enough to be cautious and we have extended the fence around the, the perimeter at the, the ridge of that and are um, discouraging people going down there until we know. I know. In summertime, it's a popular location to it's get down to the river. Is. It is. We've had two, two or three fences, I believe, temporary fences um, um, taken out and we have replaced it with a permanent fence uh, just as a precautionary measure. Thank you. Okay. Member Rogers. I promise this is my last question. It's all right. If, if we do not approve this tonight, the purchase of this park pretty much goes away. So what happens with those 15 sites in the future? Are we, are we liable to go do testing there to find out what's still there? Are we still going to have to do that? Or do we just leave it be? It's a good question. We, we've. Um you know, it's obviously something we've, we've asked ourselves. I think between knowing now what we know about the, the pipe here and that there was contaminant, there is contamination up by the railroad, and the fact that we know that other material, similar material, was delivered at an earlier time from this bleach plant across the park parcel and um, disposed of directly into the slough, that we have enough information to be concerned and we should know. And I would think that uh, there would be a, certainly a question for the council to consider. But I can tell you, our rec my recommendation and staff's recommendation was that we know enough that we should, we should find out for sure. Member Clem. Thank you. And my last question. Um, are we building a, a bridge near these yes, sites to be tested? Yes, we are. We may likely have incurred through the process of permit and or land use, these tests anyway? Where's yep. the Minnow Bridge go you're, you're related correct. on this? Um, I think it shows right here where the, where the bridge um, crosses. Uh, you may also recall that over the years there has been a lot of attention given to the design of this bridge and the fact that it is designed with two, with its anchor supports on both properties, on the riverfront on one side and it spans all the way to um, uh, to Boise Island, to the island on the other. And that is intentional in that not knowing what was in this slough or its, um, or, or knowing its history, uh, that we deliberately did not design a bridge that has foundations and piers going into the, into the, into the slough. And so as we've gone forward in designing the bridge, we have um, ta um, had test borings with DEQ and with actually the tribes uh, for archaeological concerns on the areas where this large foundation, it's a very deep foundation on both sides of the bridge will be located. Um, they both came up um, uh, negative as, as finding impacts, but we will again be, um, until the actual uh, holes are dug for the bridge um, and uh, and that the, the tests are complete. Uh, we've tried to, well, we have designed a bridge that has the least intrusion uh, into the site, understanding the archaeological and environmental sensitivities of this area. Okay. Thank you. All right. Member Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a, a comment. Uh, given 15 of these are in probably the most popular water access point at Riverfront Park, I would just suggest we would be derelict in our responsibility if we didn't go ahead. These are, this is where kids go down getting into the water with their families, people fish down there. And if that is, uh, if that is polluted, we better find out very quickly. And that's 170,000 of the 200,000 we're talking about tonight. Uh, so 
uh, this seems kind of moot. Uh, I, I really don't think anyone would vote against making sure kids going down to the river would be safe. So I think we ought to move on ahead. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are there any further questions or comments I, from I counselors? Yes. Um, excuse me. I just wanted to make one comment. We don't know what, if anything, we're going to find yet. I, w I wouldn't want people to go out thinking that this is likely to be a huge problem, but we need to know. Now there are some questions, and so the prudent, responsible thing, I think, is to do the testing. All right. Yes, Member, Member Rogers. Well, just my comment is that's the scary part yeah. is because we might find out what we don't know. And uh, when we were able, to, when we first bought the property, we were able to cap, cap it. That was one issue. And now we're talking about a total different piece. And we're, we can't just cap this piece of property. And so I don't know what we paid for this property, what our agreement is to purchase this property is, but this should be a part of it is my point. And um, it should be somebody's responsibility to fix it, and not ours. I get it. We're buying insurance. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't like it. Right. How's that sound? Okay. And and if I can uh, remind the agency, we uh, when we were developing, you know, when you develop in urban renewal areas, very often there are environmental issues. When we uh, bought the property that was called Block A and be before the Broadway Commons area. There were not prospective purchaser agreements available at that time, and we purchased the land and then spent three or four years having to do mitigation and cleanup of finding you know, a buried oil tanker, I think, in, on one piece of property. So it's um, now we have this ability to have this insurance so that the community doesn't incur these kind of costs. But it is, you don't know what you're going to find out until you start the process. And, and so I understand the concern about that. But for the environment and for the community, I think you know, it's the, the right course. All right, are there further questions or comments? All right, we have a motion on the floor. The motion is to adopt the, uh, gr to approve the grant agreement for the environmental due diligence necessary to purchase a 3.8 acre park parcel. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion oh, carries. Sorry. Let the record show that uh, Member Rogers voted no. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have no unfinished business to come before the agency, and we have no public hearing for this um, agency this evening, and this meeting is adjourned. All right, I'd like to call to order this evening's meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, September 8th, 2014. Would the recorder please call the roll? My pleasure. Councillor Bennett? Here. Councillor Tesler? Present. Councillor Nanke? Here. Councillor Claussen? Here. Councillor Dickey? Here. Councillor Rogers? Here. Councillor Benares? Here. Councillor Clem? Here. Mayor Peterson? Here. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask for approval of additions or deletions to the agenda. Do we have any? I did see a futures report um, on my table when I arrived this evening. Uh, Councillor Bennett, do you have a motion? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, we don't have, I don't believe we have additions or deletions, but do okay. be aware, as you said, there is a future report here that is uh, uh, really interesting. It is. <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. Worth reading well. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, we have comment time now from council and city manager. Do any councilors have comments to this evening to share? Councilor Dickey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, yesterday, I had the opportunity, along with uh, Mayor Peterson, 
to uh, meet at Highland Elementary, and um, I I rode my bike. She walked, but we had a, there was a caravan of neighbors that went from Highland El Elementary to the Salem Sunday Streets, which took place um, kind of in our downtown core, with several of the streets closed. There was a lot of a lot of people came out for that. A lot of great, um, e a lot of different kinds of booths. Um, there were food trucks. There was all sorts of entertainment. I mean, there was you know everything from cultural dances, punk rock band, you name it, there was something for everyone. So um, I'm looking forward to that event continuing to grow and being a great opportunity in our city. And I just wanna um, just take a moment just quickly to thank Kathy Hall for her service to the city. I mean, she's, she's the first person I met when I decided to run for office <laughs> and she's always been so very helpful. And I, I was just reminded of um, several weeks ago Someone from back east had sent a letter and said, "Hey, I'm looking for some information that was exchanged several years ago. I, I was I don't ten years ago or something, and you know had asked all of us if we had the information. And I don't know. Within a matter of really short turnaround time, it was oh, Councilor Hall got the information for me. Thank you. So that was a really telling of your service here. So thank you very much. Yes, I certainly second that. Thank you so much." Other comments? Uh, Councilor Nanke and then Councilor Clausen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And then Just Council wanted to right. uh, reflect yes. on the uh, ribbon cutting for the Mill Creek Reservoir a week ago last Friday. Yeah. Um, Senator Courtney, um, the mayor, Councilor Benars, and Councilor Nanke have a picture of their shoes, <laughs> yes, I think, on do. Facebook <laughs> somewhere. Um, it was a great grand opening. We had members of uh, the state, the college, uh, the construction folks, um, and, and city staff as well. Um, it was nice that the clouds came over just at the right time to keep it from blinding all of us in the reflection during the speeches, but uh, it, it's nice to know that that is up and functional and I'm still waiting for new neighbors out there. That's right. And we now have better fire protection than ever yes. because of the pressure and the amount of water. It's a great addition. Let's see, I know there were other hands up, and let's see, Councillor Clausen and then Councillor Bednars. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just a quick note uh, for general information, a reminder, one, City Council does not uh, control buses or busing or bus routes. <laughs> <laughs> However, there are changes going on at the transit and uh, they're doing some studies to make some efficiencies and I know I was contacted by residents of South Salem because there's some changes some, to some routes down there and uh, I encourage people to pay attention to what's going on. I had some real good discussions with some staff at Transit. They have great information up on their website right now so you can see what the proposals are that are out there. Nothing is set in stone. There's not even anything put together yet to go to the Transit Board until probably late winter, uh, maybe early spring next year. But pay attention to that. They're getting a lot of input and information right now. You'll see A-frame signs next to some bus stops where routes might change for trying to solicit information. and. Uh, pretty big deal going on. I think they've got some good thoughts and good ideas that they're talking about and uh, hopefully it'll make our bus system a little bit more appealing and improve some ridership. Great. Thank you. Councillor Benars. I had two items that I wanted to talk about a little bit tonight. One was to outreach to the community in general on I have uh, made a face page or Facebook page, uh, Warren Bernard Salem City Council, and I invite people to join it. It's a location where I've been trying to post agenda meeting items or things in particular that face my ward, Ward 7, but certainly would face the city in general. Uh, whether it was pictures of the of the um, reservoir that was just built when we were de dedicating it or otherwise but I just I'm trying to reach out to make sure that my ward that our community is hearing things and if Facebook is the way that people want to communicate I'm going to try to go down that road having said that I also wanted to remind people that every Wednesday at nine o'clock at Minto Island at the dog park I meet it's called walk with your counselors and our counselor because I'm the only one there but anyway uh, we meet at the dog park at nine o'clock you don't have to have a dog if you don't have one we'll loan you one at the time uh, it's a lot of fun sometimes we talk about politics sometimes we just talk about the weather and the dogs so no pressure but it's another way to get access if you want to bend an ear basically 
Uh, the second item that I wanted to cover was a week from tonight on September 15th at five o'clock in the Peace Plaza. We'll be doing the annual Community Volunteer Awards. Uh, it's a great evening to uh, pat people on the back who have given so much back to this community in many, many countless hours in many, many ways. Um, and I do believe uh, food will be provided for dinner that, that evening. Uh, come and enjoy and celebrate. Even if you're not one of the recipients, uh, clap the uh, other people along and, and uh, give them a high kudos. So those are the two. Thanks. Are there other comments? Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mayor. I just had overlooked uh, this Wednesday at 5 o'clock is City Hall Day, just as a reminder to uh, mm -hmm. the councilors, as well as to let the community know that mayors and councilors from several of the uh, the neighboring cities as well get together um, and speak with our state representatives to uh, tell them what things we might like them to do a little better or, or things that would make our lives easier or things that are, are giving us difficulty. So uh, we speak to them on a frequent basis, but this gives a chance for us to gang up on them <laughs> rather than vice oh. versa. <laughs> now that you've assured they won't come. <laughs> now I'm sure they will come and it's always been a really well attended event and one that I think is beneficial, not a negative. Yeah, yes, thank you. City Manager, did you have a comment? I do. Two? I have a few things. Uh, one is, as we mentioned last week, we all, or the last meeting, we also have a citywide Facebook uh, page now, and you can find a link uh, to that on the home page of the city's website. And um, we're ha uh, appreciated if people like the uh, Facebook page so that it comes up uh, higher in the order of Facebook. So, And we're posting three times a week new information about things that are going on in the city. Um, I wanted, and Mina, if you could stand up, I wanted to introduce our new Human Resources Director, Mina Hansen, who today has her first day, and we're really happy to have her here. Welcome. So, Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, later on in the agenda, we're going to talk about a new neighborhood app, app, and it's the first app we've designed in the city, and it actually was from a, an idea that Councillor Dickey gave us. One day, you may remember, at one of these uh, council meetings, she said, you know, it would be really nice if there was something that people could download onto their iPhones where you could find out where you, what neighborhood association you belong to, where the meetings are, what the agenda is, and so we have that prepared, and we're going to demonstrate that a little uh, later in the evening, we appreciate uh, Councillor Dickey for uh, raising the idea and our wonderful IT department for putting it into action. So you'll see more about that in a minute. We have, uh, we did have open Sandy streets and we just have a few photos that we could show you. Uh, Mr. Rogers will put those up. It, uh, while they're doing that, I'll, I'll second the comments that have been made. It really was a lovely event and, and well attended. Great fun for everyone and uh, really kudos to the other organizations and the churches that surrounded the area. I saw a lot of uh, groups having uh, lunch after church right out in the streets and a really community building event. And um, thanks to the Halley Ford Museum of Art, open. Uh, a nice, cool, uh, lovely place to go. A lot of people were in there, uh, including families with children. It was nice to see that. And um, the First United Methodist Church allowed people to ring the bell yes. in, the in the steeple. So the bells were ringing not on the hour or anything, but it was great fun because you kept hearing the bells ring. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, do you have comment on the pictures? Uh, yeah, I do. Just a few. G good evening, Madam Mayor, City Councilors. My name's Brady Rogers. I'm the administrator of the Neighborhood Enhancement Division. Uh, yesterday, September 7th, was our second annual Sa Salem Sunday Streets event. And it started off with uh, the running of the bulls. Our own Cherry City Derby girls were all in their regalia there and chased runners once around. We had uh, four musical acts after that. And uh, it was a lot of fun. We had. Um, over 30 partners and seven contributors that uh, put this on with our own Corinne Fletcher. This is great. I hope these guys aren't in trouble, Jerry. These are a couple of the uh, bike police officers uh, that were on the route, and they took time out to play a game of Frisbee golf with a uh, uh, couple of the kids there. <laughs> Oh, going back. Nice. And this is one of the uh, uh, March 4th marching band guys. They were all over the place on these uh, huge, huge stilts, dancing up and down the steps of the Capitol. It was uh, almost like the Cirque du Soleil. Huh. 
And here's the uh, food pot alley. You could get crepes. They had uh, snow cones and burgers and uh, Philly uh, cheesesteaks, Asian food, just right. almost everything you can imagine. Um, there's a picture of the, um, uh, they're doing a little marching. You can see the tall guy in the back. The marching band is uh, about to turn the corner there and everybody's about to follow along. This is an interesting thing. This is an, uh, uh, what I want in, in downtown. We'll get this information back for all of you, but everybody that was at the event was welcome to put their idea on this little bit of a wall. And, and if it was something you wanted to see downtown, uh, you were invited to write it. It's kind of hard to read this, but we'll get it all in a, in a form where you can read it. This is a neat picture. This is one of the uh, Cirque du Soleil. Uh, that little girl is Jessica, our own Jessica Price's daughter, who's on the shoulders of her, her grandfather. And this is one of the gals on stilts came walking by and gave her a, a very, very high five. <laughs> and these are the Derby girls. They've just finished uh, chasing down the, the runners. Uh, they've come down the street and realized there's some stragglers uh, but back behind them. And they're about to turn around and go get them, too. They got them with the uh, little inflatable uh, bats. Uh, it didn't hurt, but they were all in fun. And here's another one of these uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil guys from the March 4th marching band. He was dancing up and down those steps like, uh, like it was just unbelievable. And there's the band itself, and they put on a really, really, really great show. That was the headlining act. And I think this is the final uh, uh, final part where they were just marching back. They took the whole crowd around, uh, once around the Capitol Mall and off to their bus where they piled on in and, and that was the end of the event. So there you have it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for, have, for taking or having someone take those wonderful photos and bringing those to share tonight. It was a and great I success. A couple of other things. I wanted to especially recognize Brady Rogers and Corinne Fletcher, who uh, from our community development department put all of this together. And this was our second annual event. We learn more things every year, and we expect to even have a better event next year. And uh, really welcome everyone from the community to come down and just enjoy the time with their friends and neighbors and family. And so now I have some really good news for you. Um, we have had our general obligation uh, credit rating upgraded from double A minus to double A, which is really a significant improvement. <laughs> this has been about a five-year goal <laughs> of ours to have this done. And some of their comments were Salem's local economy is adequate and stable. We have very strong management with strong financial practices and policies. Very strong budget for cherry flexibility shown by available reserves. Very strong liquidity shown by available cash and availability to the market if borrowing needs arise. Um, at that time when we, we did the rating, we, th we didn't have our last revenue numbers yet, so it looked like we could eat into our beginning fund balance, which we didn't have to. But they said adequate budgetary performance shown with uh, year-end surpluses. They note that 77% of the principal of our GO debt will be retired within the next 10 years. Years. And, and one of the weaker points is there's potential of increases in contingent liabilities for PERS and other post-employment benefits, which we'll know about soon, and strong institutional framework for Oregon municipalities. So we feel very pleased about that. And what this means for the community is the next time we go out for ge general obligation debt, there'll be a lower interest rate, and so it doesn't cost as much to borrow money for uh, projects. So it's a great thing. Thank you. Great. I want to say a special kudos to our city manager, Linda Norris. She ably and carefully guides us in many, many, many financial decisions that we're making. She always brings us information in a timely manner and has been a, a tremendous steward of the city's funds. And I just compliment you, and I know this is, is in really large part because of your dedication to our fiscal responsibility. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. But I have to say it's also because we have a great finance department and great budget staff, our department heads and all of our division managers. Uh, and really through every employee in the city they are just very careful about money. So thank you. They are. Good. Councillor Clem. Can, can we, uh, is Kelly still here? She is. Yeah. She is. Kelly, okay, do you want to there's come the up? reason she why is. we're able to save money. And uh, <laughs> it's Kelly Jacobs. 
<laughs> Kelly, you've retired, but we brought you back. I'm not sure oh. if I know your current status, but Actually, thank you. Actually, Kelly is still working. She cannot Good. retire. Good. Don't retire. <laughs> We've had enough. But thank you very much, Kelly. You know, great budget work, and that's the reason why we're able to uh, go into the future costing less. Thanks. It's really great. And Deborah Bond, does everyone know Deborah Bond, who's the head of yeah. our administrative services and finance? And Sandra Montoya. Sandra is Sandra. In the, not yet, not in, still in the council chambers. All of these people, Casey Duncan, everyone played a big role in making this happen. That's great. All right, uh, Councilor Tesler. So I have one thing, and it's not sexy or cool like any of the other stuff, but it's important. Um, I was driving home the other day, and I, don't, I never know if it's me or you, but I think it's me. But on Pringle Road, they have started doing the sidewalks. And they can only do just the one bit because I think there was a development close by. But I long for the day when there are sidewalks yeah. on both sides of Pringle Road because right now there's just a bike lane, mm. and I'm grateful there's a bike lane. But unfortunately, everybody walks in the bike lane. The school kids walk in the bike lane. Mm -hmm. It's real busy on Pringle Road. Um, people put their trash cans out in the bike lane. There's roadkill in the bike lane. When you're riding a bike, it's interesting in the morning. Yes. So yeah. um, someday, yeah, breakfast. Um, someday on the way, you know, it'd be, it'd be nice to get the pedestrians out of the bike lane just because it is kind of dangerous, especially for kids. And so I was real pleased to see that new sidewalk going on. It looks great. Um, pleased to see that sidewalk going up High Street. Yes, um, it's beautiful. Around beautiful. the, the uh, interesting tree and some other things. But going up High Street, um, starting to, I remember in the beginning when me and Bruce Rogers were sitting on that committee so many years ago, I remember they said, it's going to be like a snail pattern. It is start in the middle, and they're going to spiral out like this. And me and Bruce are like, yeah, we'll be dead. But I'm starting to see it's coming. It's really starting. I'm seeing that spiral really start to come out now. It's like Fibonacci's sequence, you know? It's just getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> so congratulations. It's great. I love the sidewalk. I know that's not sexy or cool, but it's important. Oh, we, we love it's sidewalks. Great. And actually, uh, Peter Fernandez and Public Works Department are working on a report to council about where we are and what we anticipate the three next future phases will be of sidewalk replacement. Good. I hope that when uh, Peter Fernandez comes with that report that he brings pictures of the High Street project because it is an incredibly yeah. complex <coughs> project and I know you've worked very hard to save the historic wall that threatens to fall on every construction worker that's out there in the tree and they were digging down today. There's a huge trench just to try to do everything properly. It's beautiful. It's really coming along beautifully. It's really nice. I have one quick thing to share, and uh, usually, you know, Linda, the city manager, and I often get to meet with people from businesses and from other agencies and departments, et cetera, and uh, don't necessarily come to council and talk about it, but we had a wonderful meeting with the new Salem Kaiser School superintendent, Christy Perry, and I wanted to make a note about it because uh, she came to us. And uh, we had a really, really uh, good, more than an hour together. And um, I just wanted to say kudos to her and, and to say to everyone, school is back in session. And I feel like there's a, a new in, you know, invigoration in the Salem Kaiser School District with the new superintendent. The other superintendent was fabulous. So I think we're, we're double lucky. And um, I just was uh, pleased to know again that the city of Salem and Salem Kaiser Schools will be working well together. And, and like Rich said, we don't run the bus company, we don't run the schools, but we cooperate and uh, it's, it's a really encouraging sign to me with, that when a superintendent makes a visit to City Hall, such a high priority right. means a lot. All right, yes, Councilor Bennett. You reminded me, Madam Mayor, just uh, uh, briefly, the uh, Northeast Neighbors celebrates its 35th year um, on September 16th. They'll be meeting at the Straub Center, Environmental Center at uh, North Sa over by North Salem High School by Olinger Pool, and their guest uh, speaker is gonna be Christy Perry to talk about her Wonderful. first uh, month or two on the job as superintendent of public schools here in Salem-Kaiser. Great. So everyone's invited from Northeast neighbors. And you can come from other neighborhoods if you'd like. All right, good, all right. Lots of things going on, lots of positive things in our community. I'm happy to hear all of those. 
our next um, item on our agenda is public comment so that everybody else can talk too, not just us. And this is for um, agenda items other than our public hearings and discussions. So we have several people signed up. I'm so pleased about that. We're always happy when people come down to City Hall to share their thoughts with us. And the way I'll do this is to call a couple of names at a time so we can alternate both podiums are live and, and um, available for the public. So we'll start off with Mark Kusick and then Timorinda Zimmerman. <coughs> Good evening, and it's three minutes, the first two minutes, then an amber light comes on at the end, three minutes, a red light. Great. Madam Mayor, Councilors, my name is Mark Cusick. My wife and I are the owner-operators of Herbal Grasslands at 1130 Roy Vaughn Avenue Southeast. A um, couple of items that I wanted to address based on the proposed regulations. Uh, on the misdemeanor drug offenses, uh, to treat those as a the same as a felony seems unreasonable. Um, I, I would really, I can tell you a story of, of a young man that I know, he's 25 years old, he is a engineering student at OSU, right now he's doing an internship for an engineering firm up in Everett, Washington. Unfortunately, five, six years ago he was in a vehicle with a, another individual who was selling some drugs. Ativan, prescription drugs. He got arrested along with the other person. He now has a misdemeanor on his record. I would trust this young man with every nickel that I have. And yet, based on the proposed, I wouldn't be able to hire him. Now, unfortunately, I probably won't be able to hire him anyway because I can't pay him anywhere near what he would make as an engineer. But he would be the type of individual I would want in my store. And to eliminate somebody like that because of one single mistake somewhere in their past just doesn't seem fair. Well, the second item I wanted to address is the hours of operation. Um, the committee that I sat on, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to do that. I appreciated that. Um, the committee basically agreed at 10, 10 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Um, I saw in there that the changes were to go from 10 to 7. That was following City of Kaiser guidelines. But if and when this becomes recreational, it will be run by OLCC. Currently, OLCC allows their stores to be open until late into the evening. Um, the last item, the uh, proposed fees. Um, really, the, the issue that I have the biggest concern with is on the financial auditing by the city. Um, I would hope that that is very discretionary and that there's really serious cause to do that, but I would also ask that that be billed at the time that, if, that an audit is done um, instead of collected up front for a potential audit to be done, uh, fee for service. Uh, basically, I mean, I, I get that this is a scary industry for, the, for the, you know, a lot of folks in the city, but you know, I would ask that, you know, if, if we've got this rule in place, that we would allow this rule to sunset at the time that um, recreational goes live. Because I, I unfortunately have no doubt in my mind that recreational will pass in November. If it never, if it doesn't pass, then this continues to move forward. Thank you very much. Your time is up. Are there questions from any of the counselors? Thank you very much. Tamira Zimmerman, followed by Raymond McMullen. Hello, um, my name's pronounced Tamindra Zimmerman. Thank you. Uh -huh, you're welcome, it's okay. <laughs> no, I like <laughs> to know, thank you. It's not the first and it won't be the last time it's um, not no. pronounced correctly. I am um, co-owner of First Choice uh, Cannabis 4142 South Rib Liberty Road. And I first want to say thank you to all of you for this opportunity to speak. And I know that you all have been working very diligently on these topics, and I really respect that. Um, I first want to quickly address the, the topic of the yearly audit fee. Um, and I want, to, I want to put in my two cents. I believe that starting low, um, preferably $1,000 or under, uh, would be appropriate. Um, as time goes on, the cost and fees can be adjusted and amended um, within the law. And um, 
we can always increase the fee if necessary. I, I, as, as far as I understand this fee, imposing the fee, um, it, it, the, the idea of it is not to put people out of business, but it's rather to support the program within the city. I, I believe that that's the goal. Um, so I think it's really important that everybody keep that in mind. Um, we don't want to put business, businesses out of business. We want to make more businesses because that makes us all more money. Um, another important topic that affects um, us particularly, me, my, my dispensary, um, is the 100-foot residential ban that you guys have kind of been going back and forth over. And I, I want to express that in my situation, uh, the 100-foot ban would affect me. However, my store is facing, and, and I can never say this, the, the word correctly, arterial street. Uh, it directly faces Liberty Road, and we have a Liberty Road address. Uh, so even though uh, we are within 100 feet of the neighborhood, it is directly behind us, and we are separated by a very large fence. So. Um, if you are considering going down that route, um, I would consider maybe n putting in something that, if, as long as it's on an arterial road, um, that that would be okay. And, um, and that's it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. I think some people have questions. Some counselors have questions. I see Counselor Dickey and then Counselor Rogers. Yeah, thanks for coming down. Um, I'm curious to know if you have, um, since you're really close to a residential area, are, do you have other businesses near you and what kinds of businesses yeah. are they? Actually, we are in a little shopping center. Um, the business right next door to us is a lottery kino um, pub where alcohol, it's a bar, can be purchased. And then the uh, business directly located next to that business is a mini mart, like a, a neighborhood convenience store. You can purchase cigarettes, alcohol, um, ramen noodles. <laughs> so, yeah. Cotton balls. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? Councilor Rogers? Uh, thanks for coming down. This is Zimmerman. Uh -huh. um, I, I think you may have answered the question without uh, Are you zoned commercial today? You're yeah, we are commercial. Zoned. Okay, you yeah. just like you must have a residential behind yeah, you. Yeah, there's just a there's just the cutoff right okay. there. Like I said, there's a big fence in between the back of the the building that we are in, and then then the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions? Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming down and your testimony. Thank you, Raymond McMillan, followed by Denise Concanon. Yes, thank you, Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council. I live within a couple blocks of the uh, Holistic Choice, the uh, one of the major, I guess we call them dispensaries now, that is going to be affected by the zoning. Um, when you're phrasing things through creating a criminal class, which is what we're looking at through recreational use of narcotics, including alcohol, that's one thing. Um, Walgreens sells Oxycontin. This is a safe access point for people who need medicine. And as far as being a neighbor there, I also run a magazine route, so I do about 500 spots in the Oregon area. and. Um, the dispensaries that are located outside of the main areas are scary. I don't feel comfortable going inside them. Mm. And I have never seen a pot dealer standing outside of a dispensary selling pot, much like there's no one standing outside of straight from New York selling pizza. So as a neighbor there, I feel that this actually reduces the amount of illegal drug activity. And as far as being close to a park, I believe this is sort of a witch hunt mentality when you have to look at the fact that you can go to the skate park and in 100 feet you can get a lap dance and a shot. So if we want to talk about the creation of a criminal class out of cancer patients, then I suggest that the council finds better and bigger things to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming down. We appreciate your testimony. Are Any there questions? questions from any of the counselors? All right, thank you very much. Denise Concanon, followed by Dino Venti. Um, my name is Denise Concan and I am the owner of Holistic Choice at 1045 Commercial Street um, in Southeast Salem. Um, I have had a business there for two years. Um, I have really appreciated the mayor and the city council working forward for medical marijuana and to make dispensaries a comfortable and safe access for the patients that I see. Um, I, I 
my concern is the buffer zone. I, if you look at the the um, the ordinance that's in front of you, it says I'm within 100 feet. So I, I asked my neighbors, how do you feel about it? I'm in a mixed use zone. I have several businesses in the um, area where I'm at. The mixed use zone has a beauty parlor and a pizza place. Um, those businesses create smells, which I think was one of the things that was brought up. Um, safety and access, I have good lighting. I have extra cameras outside because safety is an issue I next to an alley. Um, I think if you look at the commercial residential mixed use zone, the people that live in that area know that they live in an area with different kinds of businesses. I've asked those residents, how do you feel about having a cannabis dispensary by you? Um, everybody has given their okay or non-interest in it. Um, but there was nothing negative that was reported to me as a person. Um, so I, I suggest, you know, maybe look at police logs. How many, how many co times have the police been called to my shop or shops like myself? My next interest would be the buffer zones to a park. I am within a thousand feet of Bush Park. But um, I'm thankful for those parks. Uh, I, I appreciate Oregon for the number of parks we have. But that doesn't mean that somebody can leave my establishment at 1,001 feet, walk across and down the street to the park, and then light up. So that's a policing issue. That's an education piece. Um, I really just don't think it belongs on my lap and would stop me from being, doing, doing business. I am currently under the moratorium. I am not open. So I, I can tell you what this is like, it, and, it's, and it's not good. 1,600 patients going somewhere else. People not coming in our neighborhood anymore. Ask the businesses around me. They'll all tell you their business has dropped. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Are there questions from any of the counselors? All right, thanks for coming. Dino Vinti followed by Noel Bullock. Good evening. Hello, Mayor, Council, Dino Venti, and I'm um, a business owner downtown at 325 Court Street. And I guess I'll take this opportunity to change the topic and go back to uh, um, parking issues downtown. Um, so, and I, I believe I'm at the right moment to do this. Um, but I just want to actually applaud Council for their swift action at the last meeting and making that short term change to the parking situation downtown. I think you've made the right move. I've gotten positive feedback from it. Um, again, I know it's a short, short term solution, but I think it's very timely with the holiday season upon us. I think it's going to um, free up some of that, that stranglehold downtown. And uh, I've, I've received some positive feedback from it. Um, again, we're you know, starting to reach out to other business owners downtown and you know, looking for sh um, some short term solutions to the employee parking situation downtown and uh, and I feel like we're going to have something in in the very near future at least for the holiday season that that will give the city something to work with and um, again I just want to take this opportunity I know you're going to talk about this a little bit later um, I have to leave now so I just want to say thank you um, thanks for listening to us um, I'm in it and I'll see this all the way through and uh, you know I'm looking for something that's really going to work for all businesses downtown and not just mine or, or a particular group, but I know that you know there's over 500 businesses that that rely on an effective parking district that manages turnover properly. So again, thank you very much. Well, thank you. We really appreciate your efforts in the community and, and downtown, and appreciate you coming this evening. Are there questions from councilors? Councilor uh, Tesla. Thanks, Dino. Great to see you. You know, the best thing about this parking thing is that it came from you it came exactly. from you it didn't come from me or him or any of us it came from you the business owners and that's the way it's got to be right. you guys have got to come together and solve the issues and bring us the ideas so that we can make it work and you've been done a tremendous amount of heavy lifting down there I did hear some moaning but you know <laughs> you're gonna get you you talk to these people because they're your people yes, they they are. they are you so that's the best thing about this parking thing mm -hmm. i mean frankly in eight years this is the best mm -hmm. i have seen this happen because it can't be us it's got to be you and you're making it happen and you too back there i see you so it's good <laughs> i really appreciate it thank you very much 
Yes, thank you. Other comments or questions from counselors? All right. Have a good thank night. you so much. Good night. Noel Bullock followed by Flynn Case. Thank you, Madam Mayor, <laughs> counselors. Uh, I'm going to talk fast because I have a few issues to cover and not much time, but I do intend to summarize my comments uh, with an email to <laughs> Manager Norris's office for forwarding to the appropriate personnel. Uh, first of five, oh, um, I'm a Salem resident and I am the person responsible for the medical marijuana dispensary Cherry City Compassion at 2025 25th Street out by the airport. First thing, um, it looks like by the agenda we've got a reading today, a public comment, and a potential vote on October 13th with an effective date of this ordinance to go in October 27th. These are just housekeeping issues, by the way, so that's why I'm talking fast. I'm going to type this all up later. Um, but for the record, uh, it looks like the license, well, it does say the license is from January 1st to December 30. So I propose some kind of fit gap solution for October 27th through January first because there's no legal way for any patients to get access to medical marijuana in that window without some type of fit gap solution. Um, so we can work on that and I will propose some language but I hope that's entered into the calculus as we move forward. Item number two, uh, initial license, if it was to, if we were to have a license go into effect on October 27th, we might want to consider either a prorated license fee, whatever one sixth of 4,000, 1,000, or whatever thousand we're looking at to be, or possibly a 14 month license to start with that rolls in on the next year. Uh, item number three, uh, 31.075. This gets into the uh, employees and volunteers engaging in some type of malfeasance and how the person responsible for the facility or the principal owner then possibly being guilty of a misdemeanor and the operative word here is knowingly. That's just really fuzzy language to me and it's really scary. Uh, so you know if an employer or a volunteer decides to make a horrible decision I can somehow be a criminal for that. I just don't see where that happens anywhere else in my republic and I'd hope we could soften that language a skosh. Uh, item number four 31.105B special fees for audits. We've heard a little bit about this before. You know, Arthur Anderson hasn't been around since Enron blew up, but they were 10,000 an hour. So uh, again, some, some type of clarification, a little less fuzzy on that would, would certainly give my blood pressure uh, a good thing. That's it, really. Thank you so much for your time. Again, I'll summarize my comments and forward them to Manager Norris's office for forwarding to the appropriate person. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, <coughs> Councillor Bennett and then Councillor Dickey. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you for coming down. I had the chance to visit your uh, uh, store um, before you opened and, yes. and was impressed with what I saw there. I thought you were doing a really good job. Your location. You must have the best location in town in terms of not being affected by any of the uh, potential setbacks. And But I was intrigued because there is one you mentioned. I would like to understand again this, um, what sounds like a window that opens and closes on you on October 27th or can, can you kind of explain that just again? That's I'm not sure I understand that. Certainly, Councillor, Madam Mayor. Uh, that is the, the language in the proposed ordinance as it's written that we'll hear tonight, I assume, for the first reading, uh, is that it's declared emergency uh, passage and goes into effect October 27th. However, down in the weeds, licenses are from January 1st through December 30th. Your state license. City license. City okay. License. Okay. So there seems to be no legal way to operate between those two dates unless we get some additional language in there. Okay. Uh, so that's thank what you. I that... proposed. And uh, just as a follow-on response, thank you for your kind compliments to my facility. But I must point out that while my neighbors are very happy with me now, if we went with the most restrictive terms of this ordinance as it's written, on one hand, while that might be a financial boon to my organization, it might be horrible for the relations with my fellow tenants if my traffic tripled where I'm not a nuisance yeah. now, I may be. You might have to put a street light in there. <laughs> um, so something else to consider. Great. Thanks, Thank you very much. I believe Councillor Dickey had a question. 
Yeah, thanks for coming down and um, pointing out, um, especially that um, license deadline. So I hadn't really caught that, so I appreciate that. Um, I have a completely different question, um, just because I know you've been in business for a while. And I'm just wondering, um, I assume you're familiar with how the health authority conducts, you know, their, you know, you go through the, the application process with them and then you're inspected. I'm curious to know if, you know, like if when they come in, they inspect you, they, you know, they probably check their boxes to make sure that everything is correct. If, um, and, and I don't mean you specifically, I'm just asking because you, you know, you've been through this process. Yep. If um, something were to be not completed, is there, do they come back? Do they follow up to make sure, I mean, do they give you a window of time um, to complete that, or do you know what that process is? It's a fairly straightforward audit process. There's recommendations and findings. Uh, the the text that the state uses or the process is that the manager, the yeah. PRF, would have 10 business days to issue a management response if they weren't comfortable that you had proven that you had remedied the findings. Then a follow-on inspection would be warranted. Okay. <coughs> All right, are there any further questions? Councilor Tesler. I just wanted to remark upon, um, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of the ORSs surrounding this, and I was absolutely amazed at how much you knew at the work group meetings. I would go home and check this dude just to make sure, and he was right. And I really was impressed with the way that you knew that stuff backwards and forwards, and I found you'd be quite knowledgeable and a resource on the work group because you know this stuff and and I think that's really laudable and I also have not been inside your location but I've been inside your neighbors many many times because you're next door to Salem Ale Works so what could be better than that <laughs> it has its advantages they have a wonderful IPA <laughs> Thank you all very much and the state rules advisory committee will be reconvening next month down at the Capitol to button up or finalize the state rules for medical marijuana dispensaries after director Burns has made his public appearances. Uh, so we'll be finishing that up as well. All right. Any further questions or comments from counselors? Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Oh, Councillor Bennett. Help me out on the $4,000 licensing fee at the state level. Where did that number come from? Um, actually, that was a point of quite some debate. Uh, the former Lincoln County District Attorney, now working for the League of Oregon Cities, uh, Mr. Bovet and I were arguing about whether that was reasonable and appropriate. Uh, I looked at, you know, uh, other personnel expenses, what was you know, usual for an inspection, uh, how many facilities, w was there any attempt to quantify how many facilities they expected and what the workload would be? And that, uh, that seemed well received, but ultimately fell on deaf ears. They pretty much just made it up. What, what was the number you came up with? What you Actually, my uh, report to Director Burns was about three pages long and very much in the weeds. Uh, as I used to be. What kind was of the a bottom line guy. in the weeds? Hmm? What was the bottom line? Uh, mine for the state, assuming 300 licensees, was around $2,300. Uh, because they were only given a budget of 480 some thousand, and they're only allowed to go to spend 30% over that. So having any excess money, they wouldn't have the limitation to spend it anyway, and they wouldn't be able to carry over. So it didn't make any sense yeah. if you want to get in the weeds on budget stuff. Um, but yeah. OK. Right. right. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Flynn case followed by Travis Chesnick. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council members. I'm Flynn Case, a uh, lifelong resident of Salem, <clears throat> and I own uh, numerous commercial, agricultural, and residential properties in Marion and Polk counties. In several of my uh, formerly vacant buildings, I've had applications for lessees to get involved in this uh, industry. Uh, they got their licenses provisionally approved back in March, but didn't get their final licenses until after the April 28th meeting and the deadline on the moratorium. Now reading what you've got here, what my concern is they've spent many thousands of dollars building out, getting ready for the dream time of October, but it's not really addressed in your rules. Some of the new buffer things are going to impact them, uh, setback requirements. 
what I would like to see you consider is some sort of a grandfathered in language for the existing businesses that are open, uh, like the, the esteemed speaker just before me, <coughs> and also for the people that were provisionally licensed but by the arbitrary moves of the uh, Division of the Health Authority didn't get their certification before the deadline of May 1st or April 28th. Uh, this is what concerns me. Of course, I want these businesses to open and pay me a lease down the road, but I think it's only fair for the people that are involved, uh, the one with holistic choice and so forth, to serve their patients. I have a 91-year-old father. He has uh, hip disorder and arthritis, and he gets quite a bit of relief using a medical marijuana oil. You know, I want him to be able to get that easily. Uh, unfortunately, his wife just diagnosed with cancer. Maybe that will be an answer for her for some relief. I don't think this should be a criminal class. I don't think it should be treated that way. Uh, as another speaker said, you know, hey, Walgreens sells Oxycontin. You know, so that's what I'd like to see. Uh, you know, I think that's a good consideration for people that have spent a lot of money. Uh, let's avoid a situation possibly for litigation against the city and the cost of that. Sounds like you need the money to check out the pipeline uh, and let these people do their business. There's a lot of people that get relief from marijuana, and it's not a narcotic drug that's going to cause a problem. Uh, they can't consume it on site. I think some of the setback requirements are unnecessary. Uh, that's what I would like to see. All right. Uh, just for Questions? the record, could you please state your address or your ward, please? My ward? Yeah, uh -huh. or, your, or your address, your address home address. Address one of my properties? Uh-huh. Uh, well, your, your residence? Street. Oh, my residence is West Salem. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry. All right. I live out in the country. Ward, ward already. Okay. <laughs> are there questions from any counselors? Counselor Clem. Yes, Ken. Thank you. Thanks for coming in, too. Sure. Um, grandfathering um, could be, uh, if it were, if all the facilities that were operating were grandfathered, it essentially <coughs> exempts them from further regulation or this regulation. So if grandfathering is problematic for us, uh, w do you think we should look at at least um, offering the, app, the, the, one, the facilities that are already operating sort of a first choice? Uh, you know, a, a priority in the application process. Well, that's what I'm trying to say, because no, it wasn't up to the facilities. You know, everybody had March 3rd, 8.30, put your application in. Okay, so how did they come back? We don't know. You know, uh, I have two tenants. One had made an application at 8.30, the other one at 8.36. One got it back uh, three weeks later than the other. They met all the criteria. So they had no control of that. So you've got kind of an unfair monopoly to the people in business already. Um, and, you know, it's great for them, bad for the other people. So what I would like to see is at least the people that went to that effort, 8.30 that morning, and got it done and met all the criteria of the state, I realize you guys want to have your own set of city controls, and that's only fair. It's your city. It's our city. So maybe we could meet, you know, some, somewhere meet in the middle, but, you know, get away from this, like, 500 patient thing. I saw this in there. I don't know if you're really considering that. I think that's really unfair because how many people come from out of the city into the Salem to shop? You're not telling Rite Aid. They can only have a Rite Aid on this corner. We're going to have a Rite Aid and a Walgreens right across the street from mm -hmm. each other. No restriction on 1,000 feet between them. So some of it, I think, is ridiculous overregulation, but, you know, that's what we got. We got it from the health authority. You guys want to follow it. I think it should follow more of the health authority's guidelines already because people have spent many tens of thousands of dollars meeting that criteria. If there's some weaknesses in it, maybe we can address that. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's, we're not going to have people stepping out of these stores and, like she said, going to Bush Park and smoking their marijuana. Uh, I think probably about 30, 40 percent of people prefer to take it, like my father, in a, a little oil that he drips on his tongue. And uh, he wouldn't smoke anything if you put a gun to his head. Sure. And I, I was just wondering what your comment was. if. If grandfathering wasn't possible, would a, well, would a priority system for yeah, those kind of who priority. did make the investment yeah, should, should be allowed to apply first? Sure, they should have some priority because they were involved. You know, yeah, and that's, the money. that's the question. Yeah, Thanks. sorry. Okay. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate thank your testimony. You uh, Travis Chesnick, followed by Jamie Peters. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's fine. Jamie Peters. Followed by Margo Lucas. Hello. We welcome. Please state your name and address. My and name is Jamie Peters. I live at 4145 Kinslow Court. 
And I'm speaking as a regular customer of downtown about the parking. And uh, Councillor Tesler, you mentioned that you were happy that this came from Dino and the business owners. But I was personally happy as a customer of downtown to see the customers push for this and pursue unlimited parking downtown. Personally, I've noticed I've been a regular customer for a while. I was there during the two hour limits. I was there when there used to be unlimited parking around near the bus station. And I've noticed that since going back to the unlimited again, I personally spend more time and enjoy it more again downtown town before I would have to okay I'm going out to lunch I've got to set my alarm now because I need to make sure I rush back to my car in time to not get a ticket that kind of downplays the enjoyment I'm sitting there sometimes w get your food ordered you want to sit down and enjoy a conversation enjoy your food you got to wait for your food to get there eat it you're suddenly feeling like okay now I have to scarf this to get back to my car in time or I would have to get up tell the restaurant hey, I gotta go move my car, it's that two hour time window again. Circle the block, try to find something close by, rush back to my food, guess what, now it's cold. That's not the only time that's happened. It's happened with shopping, maybe I'm waiting in a long line, it's busy. I personally think two hours was not enough ever. Three hours, maybe still pushing it. Four, I think would be preferable, or personally, maybe only institute time limits during the holidays when it's busy, we'll leave the unlimited during the off seasons maybe investigate building another parking garage downtown, like the vacant lots. I used to work for the state offices downtown, and I thought it was a shame to see that unused vacant parking lot there. Why not build something that can allow and accommodate more parking that people can walk to these businesses downtown? And I just think there are other alternatives, but anyway, I'd, I'd appreciate if you guys would consider the customers and the business owners would think about that too, and think maybe people are spending more time downtown and able to hit more of those businesses they like, like myself when you don't have to worry about that rush back to your car, move it. Thank you. Thank you, are there any questions? Uh, Councilor Tesler? I'm just curious um, why you don't park in the structures. I personally, like I was talking to Dino outside, he noticed that I had signed up and opposed to this and I was mentioning part of it is a safety issue. There are sometimes, I have a nicer car, I drive an Audi TT, I don't trust certain areas or certain parking garage. I've seen people that hang out around there. I don't feel comfortable walking back by myself late at night if I'm out, you know, went to dinner, maybe grabbed a drink afterwards. I don't want to walk to a dark parking garage. It makes me a little nervous. Um, also, there's the convenience of a lot of shops I like are right in the Court Liberty area. If my car's right there. I can just go throw stuff I buy in the car, walk to the next place. I don't have to be lugging bags all over. Convenience and safety. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. other questions? All right, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. mm -hmm. Margot Lucas, followed by Jim Vu. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to start by thanking everybody again for all the time you've taken to go over this ordinance with us. We really appreciate that. Um, the rule of the day is reasonable and rational. rational. Um, 1531 gave you the ability to make reasonable restrictions on time, place, and manner, and that's what we've asked you for. Um, I have made recommendations, and I understand there may be some amendments that may be made some motions for, and we appreciate that. Um, I will go um, to the what I'm going to refer to as the Clem amendments. Um, I would say that we would be in support of those. Um, the first one, eliminating bus barns and administrative buildings from the uh, from the description of schools. Um, the second one being about the application process, and the third one being about the hundred foot rule, um, unless you're on in a major arterial. So I would say we are in support of those and we appreciate your input on that, Councillor Clem. I would further go from there though to say that we would still ask for a 500 foot um, park buffer. The ordinance now asks for a thousand foot. We would like to split that difference. Um, we, smoking in parks is illegal. That's an issue that the police can deal with now and going forward with the current laws we have on the books. Please don't hold these, these dispensary owners responsible for something that happens more than 500 feet away from their facilities that they truly have no control of. Um, in addition to that, we have suggested a $1,000 licensing fee. And we would like to see um, 
justified increases to that if it's going to be increased. Um, we would like to hear that licensing fee um, justified. Um, and also, it's been suggested that any audit fee be included in that license fee rather than it be an additional fee. And the other things that we wanted to just touch on briefly was the inspection of records um, and the audits in general, those two, those two parts of it. Um, as we go forward, there may be changes to state and federal law, and we would just like to suggest that there potentially be a sunset clause on those inspection of record and audit sections. Um, and in, in addition to that, there were just some small housekeeping items that we could probably go over um, off the record, just some minor, minor points that I will send you an email on. So other than that, I think I'm done, and if you have any questions, I'll remain. Thank you very much. Appreciate your work on the committee and your time testifying tonight. Are there questions from counselors? All right, thank you very much. Jim Vu. Welcome. Hi there, Councilor. How are you guys doing? Jim Vu, uh, owner of the building 466 Court Street Northeast, artist formerly known as Casey's Hot Dogs, and uh, soon to be the kitchen. And wanted to uh, share with you guys a lot of the feedback that we had since our last uh, statement that we made as downtown business owners. Um, a lot of the feedback and from the business perspective is that we're doing our best um, as business owners to create an environment that is customer centric and customer conducive. Um, just reiterating the fact that every decision we're making moving forward is focusing upon the customer experience downtown. Um, and it's not just for who has a spot first. Great, that those thousand people have an on-street parking and you're awesome. We have 500 businesses um, that need more than a thousand people to support that. So being able to support that world and really creating the parking garages and the parkades as one that's a very, very viable option uh, was eye-opening. And I think this is a statement that's been really um, insightful for the public is that there are 1,100 parking spots on street in the downtown parking area. Um, that's the equal number in the Marion Parkade by itself. So being able to put those numbers together, that there's parking there, we just need to teach the people of downtown Salem how to use it so that all of us can benefit downtown together. And that's where we're, the goal we're working toward. So thank you for working with us, um, the support, and um, look forward to finding a solution for our city. That's great. Mr. Vu, thank you so much for all the time and effort that you've put into uh, really uh, coalescing uh, what were almost strangers as far as the individual <coughs> business owners and, and business managers downtown. You really brought them together and we appreciate that so much. This communication has helped us tremendously. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And now, counselors, are there any questions? No. All right. Thank you so much. All right. That concludes our time for public comment. I'm going to allow for a short break so people can sort of readjust themselves in the council chambers, and then we'll get right back to business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now resume our meeting, and we are at the point of item three, the consent calendar. Councillor Bennett, do you have a motion? I do, Madam Mayor. I move the consent calendar uh, with the notation that uh, Councillor Rogers votes no on 3.3C. All right. Second. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Benars to move the consent calendar with the notation that Councillor Rogers is registering a no vote on the item 3.3C. Is there any discussion regarding the consent calendar? Yes, Madam Mayor. I just want to, uh, uh, rather than uh, take the time, it's getting a little bit late uh, to go through specifically, this generally is a consent deck calendar uh, dominated by uh, budget adjustments and considerations. Uh, there's not a lot of real 
uh, difficult policy questions. The one Councillor Rogers vote noted, uh, voted no on is the one we discussed earlier regarding the $200,000 due diligence on the uh, 3.8 acre uh, park parcel, and we had pretty extensive discussion mm -hmm. of that. All right, thank you. So it's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Benares to move the consent calendar with the one notation of the uh, uh, negative vote by Councillor Rogers on item 3.3C. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries, thank you. We have no public hearings this evening and no special orders of business or unfinished business. We have information reports, uh, several, that are listed in the packet. Draw your attention to those. Right. And, uh, Mayor, we were gonna do a very brief demonstration of the neighborhood app, if that's all right. Oh yes, where, when do you wanna do that, right now? Uh, if we could do it now, that would be all great. Right. Oh, I see, that's here on 7B. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew it was in here somewhere, and I couldn't remember where it was. Yes. Okay, good. Are you going to introduce And uh, Paul Bashevitz uh, from our IT department is yeah. going to provide Madam the information. Madam Mayor, All right. Welcome. city council members, my name is Paul Bashevitz. I'm the city IT systems and programming supervisor. And I'll, I'll try to make the demo brief, but I'm going to follow along with what you had in your attachment with one exception is that I'm going to go to the site and actually show you how you could invoke this on your phone so in the attachment it gives you an overview of the application and the application was written based on requirements we got from your uh, neighborhood association uh, and your CD department so we put it together we took in mind things that we already had in place and also the ability to uh, take advantage of newer technology with some responsive design so that it would fit on uh, any particular device that you might be running it on and it resizes to your screen or to your tablet or phone device so if you get to a browser on your phone and go to the city of Salem.net site. Excuse me while I have to type that in. Once you get to the site, uh, we tried to make it as easy as possible for you to just to, on your phone to find the application so you can go to the search bar and just type in the application's sh short name of SNAP which is Salem Neighborhood Association application and then you'll, it'll bring up a link that you can then click on the link and that'll take you to the neighborhood page where we're going to have it available for uh, public, general public, to go ahead and uh, find the application. We'll also add a link to the How Do I page, which will make it easy for people to find a way to get to it. But this was for your, you know, making it easy for you to get to the application. So when the application comes up, one of the first things you see is that it gives you the ability to set a default neighborhood association, so you can pick and choose which neighborhood you want to associate your device to. Or you can use this Find My Neighborhood and use the map uh, application component to actually locate where, what neighborhood you're in. When you choose the set of default, you get the list of neighborhoods that you can pick from and then choose that and then it immediately assigns it uh, on your device so that'll be retained until you choose to change it. And you can change it either through this extra link that gives you the ability to change it or go in through our help uh, toolbar and change it there as well and so the menu options you have are, are pretty simple you have the home page which you're looking at currently 
The calendar gives you access to the neighborhood association calendar that's published on our internet page. So that just shows you the immediate neighborhood association calendar. You get the view, you can actually view information about the different neighborhood associations. Once you choose a neighborhood association, you click on the link, it shows you the information associated with that neighborhood. And this is where we took the data directly off our neighborhood page and were able, was able to reproduce it into this application for easy access. So it's the same information that would be managed by those already managing the content on your neighborhood association pages. And again, like I said, the view gives you the ability to either join the mailing list. Again, that's the same link off of the neighborhood association page or actually choose one of these other neighborhood associations and see its related information. And then the map gives you the ability to find where you are in the city relative to your neighborhood association. And there's several features on the map. One is you can find where you are on your device or actually type in an address or just click on a neighborhood and get some pop-up with information and links about that neighborhood. Any questions? Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I followed right along with you. I mean, it's even the Did it work? Can, yeah, it worked. Great. It works great. Um, how do we get, if a neighborhood association wants to get the word out, hey, Next Monday, we're talking about stuff. Can the chair of the neighborhood association or the vice chair or somebody go in and sort of get it out on Facebook that they've got a hot topic they want to talk about? Is, is that, there a that would be independent of this. But whatever you they publish on the city's neighborhood page, if I come out here yeah. on the residence and go to the neighborhood page, mm -hmm. This information is what we're pulling the information from. So Are they posting to the neighborhood pages, or is the city staff doing that? That I don't know. Okay. I, I thought it was individual Brady. neighborhoods. Um, good evening, Madam Mayor, City Councilors. My name's Brady Rogers. I'm the Administrator of Neighborhood Enhancement Division. Um, outgoing uh, neighborhood communication uh, takes several forms. We, uh, you, you just spoke about the um, uh, getting a message out. We have an e-blast we send out once a week, and if it's a, uh, it goes to every uh, every chair and uh, board member. There's also a separate email list for each neighborhood association itself, which can be combined into different groups. Uh, we use our, currently we're using a Mailchimp application to to get those messages out. Uh, but I know IT is working on a, uh, a replacement sort of uh, uh, application uh, for that, those kinds of outgoing communications. Are there other questions from councillors? Councillor Dickey. Actually, not really a question. I just want to thank our IT staff for doing this. This is really amazing. I was um, surprised when Linda called me last week and said that you had done this. This is a really... I'm um, going to be a really great resource for our neighborhoods. And, and thanks to Brady Rogers, too, for help helping move this forward. Um, I know one of the things that you know people always say, well, not everyone uses Facebook. Not everybody's online. But we all have our different ways that we communicate. And one thing we do know, though, is that a lot of people who don't necessarily have access to a computer do have access to a smartphone. So this is a great way that we're going to be able to connect with people. So I really appreciate that. In fact, um, yesterday at the Salem Sunday Streets, I was on my bike and I ran into Brady on his bike and he whipped out his Windows phone and showed me how this all works. So it was a really cool way to connect. And um, I hope that everyone who has the opportunity to will take advantage of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, this is a tremendous step forward for us. We've been wanting uh, for a long time to really begin um, uh, to communicate with our residents in a more immediate fashion. So this is very helpful, although, excuse me, that's not very helpful. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Don't uh, even know how this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> this is the yeah. And, <laughs> so and yeah. Mayor and Council, if I can, I ran into a couple of people from City Watch uh, last Friday, and they were telling me they've been doing an informal survey just to find out how many people they run into know which neighborhood they're in, and they're finding only about 20% of those people they've talked to do, and I found myself, myself saying, well, we have a new app for that. So they were pretty excited about it, too, to find out that it'll be easy for people to find out what neighborhood they're in. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It yes. Works for me right here. <laughs> Thank you. And it doesn't talk back. <laughs> that phone has just gone into detention. <laughs> we now are at the point in our uh, agenda where we have ordinances, and I believe we have a first reading. Would the city recorder like to introduce 81A, please? Ordinance Bill Number 1714, relating to the licensing and regulation of medical marijuana facilities, creating new pre provisions, and declaring an emergency. Okay, I believe we have a motion regarding yeah. 8.1A. Councilor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, I move the staff recommendation. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Benars to move the staff recommendation. Madam Is there discussion? Yes, Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, I'm moving this, Madam Mayor, to uh, get the ball rolling. I, uh, if you'll recall, Councillors, we saw, we, we saw a staff information item essentially come to us about this issue sort of asking us to begin talking about medical marijuana. One of the difficulties uh, in having that discussion is we didn't have anything to talk about. We had, a, we had an information item and no way to affect it. And it was sort of, well, what do you, at least how I heard it, and it may not have been posed this way, but it was kind of a, what do you guys think of these ideas? Well, there's really no way for us to talk about in our sessions, what do you think about these ideas? It doesn't work that way. And so I think, uh, what we decided to do was ask the staff to come back with us with a solid proposal based on action by the uh, subcommittee and stakeholder committee that had re reviewed this issue, uh, incorporating as much as they have agreed upon and uh, give it their best shot on and essentially arbitrate on the others and arbitrate any way they want and that's what they did and what I respect is they they actually took very clear positions on a series of issues uh, that I'm sure we'll be discussing. And, and that's really what this session, I think, is about, is to give us a chance to go through each of the elements that we believe are outstanding issues or that were outstanding issues come out of, coming out of the stakeholders group. We have uh, the uh, police here uh, to help us, I think, uh, the city attorney and other city staff that have some expertise in this area, along with, uh, I thought, some very uh, cogent testimony from the public and the interested parties. So I think we have a lot to work with. Plus, those of you who served on that committee uh, have real uh, individual expertise and have heard all this stuff a lot. And I, I know for myself, I'll be relying heavily on those of you who served on this uh, committee to kind of lead us through this this issue because it's got a lot of twists and turns and ones that uh, really affect people's lives, both the customers as well as the business people as well as the neighbors, both residential and commercial. Uh, it has some philosophical issues. It has an underlying kind of patina of this is a federal felony. Uh, Despite its legalization in Oregon when, you, Oregon, when you put the whole thing together, it's a pretty complicated issue. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what we can come up with. All right, it's, there's a motion on the floor. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Benars. Is that correct? Thank you. Is there further discussion? Councillor Dickey and then Councillor Clem. Yeah, is this the appropriate time to ask questions of staff? Perfect. 
Um, so I have a couple questions. Um, one, I think I had asked at the last meeting where we actually discussed this. I was curious to know if we um, had a number for any um, police calls that had been to any of the dispensaries. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, um, do you have an actual, um, at least at your best guess, breakdown of how that $4,000 would be used? Yes, thank Jerry you. Moore, Chief of Police. Uh, Councilor Dickey, in answer to your first question, I don't believe we've had a, uh, I'm not aware of a single call to one of our dispensaries in Salem. Um, uh, um, in answer to your second question, I can tell you um, we were asked to look at what we thought within the police department it might cost for us to police the dispensaries over the course of a year. Um, and we're, we're going on the assumption that um, the Oregon Health Authority would do one inspection a year. And as we discussed at the um, task force, we didn't know if that was uh, enough inspections of, of the dispensaries. So we built in additional um, inspections of those facilities. We also built in uh, the cost of what we believe the background uh, checks of all the employees and volunteers might be. Uh, and I'll just give you the basics of that. Uh, we figured we would do a, an average of five backgrounds per dispensary at an average of two hours per background, so 10 hours uh, for backgrounds. Uh, two inspections uh, per year at three hours per inspection uh, with three hours of follow-up twice per year. And then the hourly rate uh, for the city covers direct costs associated with the inspections and is based on the average cost of one of our street crimes detectives uh, and includes average cost of benefits, which would be PERS, FICA, health insurance, et cetera. So we determined that the cost uh, for police services at each dispensary would be about 1700 a little over $1,700 a year. And that did not include um, permit application center costs of 100 to $150. I believe the, um, the majority or the rest of the uh, cost that was associated with the $4,000 was outside the police department, but had to do with uh, legal costs and the costs of meetings with the city manager or someone or other members of the uh, organization. Community development, whether it had to do with zoning, uh, would incur. So I believe uh, that's pretty close to how the $4,000 fee uh, came about. I don't know if the uh, city attorney could assist there. Just to, to comment, to follow up on, on Chief's comments, the, the other costs be associated with the, um, the planning department as far as when the police department is administering this program, so, but there's the, the setbacks and whatnot from the different areas, the different affected properties. There's going to have to be an involvement with the community development department to, 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 to check those in the maps and make the determinations. I, I don't know what their exact cost would be on that, and I don't know that it comes up to the rest of the 4000 but there's other involvements from other departments other than police. Were there other questions by councilors? I think uh, Councilor Dickey, did that answer your question? All right, Councilor Clem? Yes, I have a question. Um, and, and I'm not sure who's the appropriate person to answer it, but um, would $2,000 cover most of the costs related for police department and other staff uh, a year for the permit? Um, from our best estimate, it wouldn't. Uh, we looked at what the police costs were, so this is a range that we considered. That was about seventeen to nineteen hundred, I think, when we talked about it. But we knew it didn't include legal, manager's office planning, um, the other costs, which is hard to estimate right now what that would be. And then we looked at, well, does it make sense that it would be about half of a police officer's time? And that's what we talked about last time. But that would have put it over the $4,000 uh, per license, and that seemed too high. We talked about what our understanding was of how the $4,000 state fee came up. and. We believe that we'll have probably more time than that, but settling on the same amount seemed to make sense. But this is an area we're interested in council's direction on because it's it's hard to know before the fact what the actual costs will be. It, it, is now the appropriate time to, to make amendment motions or is there, uh, do we pass the ordinance first and then do that? No, I believe we can do amendment motions at okay. this point. Isn't that correct? Yes, you can make a uh, motion to engross the ordinance. Sure. I, 
I move to engross ordinance bill, and I have three of these, but as you allocate time to the speakers, Madam Mayor, uh, I'll offer my first one. Move to engross ordinance bill 1714 to amend um, SRC section 31090, the B3B, to add the words where minors and students routinely congregate. I also emailed Right. Same exact wording too. Mm -hmm. Second. <laughs> All right, it's been moved by Councillor Clem and seconded by Councillor Benars to amend the motion to add the wording where minors and students routinely congregate. Is there discussion on that motion? Councillor Clem. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This, um, while the adding of the words makes it clear that um, this is being added to this, uh, the buffer standard for schools and only schools, it makes it clear that school properties where there aren't students or children there, um, that this, this restriction, this buffer requirement does not apply to. As um, Margo had indicated earlier, this is what we call the bus barn. Um, amendment where in fact if it's school property but there's no students there it doesn't make sense that we have a buffer standard where there aren't students it also clarifies what the uh, as provided for in the ordinance and in the staff report the drug-free zone the federal standard which exactly word it uses those same exact words so it aligns the city code with the f uh, federal drug enforcement standards given that this particular dispensed drug is still illegal for anything other than medical use, but it uses the word within a thousand feet of any place children congregate. So I'm just trying to align the city ordinance with the federal uh, ordinance. And it makes it clear that school property that um, shouldn't be uh, applied to this buffer standard in terms of medical marijuana dispensaries. Thank you. And do we vote on each individual amendment yes. to the motion? All right. So the amendment on the floor, there is a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the wording of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion, motion carries and Councillor Clausen voted no. Thank you very much. Councillor Clem, you have another? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, I definitely appreciate the idea of trying to get something out there that's going to be as close as we want to get when we get to the public hearing. But to be totally honest, I'd rather get something on the street, get the public hearing, and then come back and engross the ordinance. I'm fine doing it either way, but I mean, to be honest, I haven't read the email. I haven't had time to think about it. I don't know that I feel real comfortable making big changes to it mm -hmm. on the fly to put something out for discussion. I think the idea of this was to get it out for discussion. I'd rather get it out for discussion, get the feedback and then make the votes on it. Because something like that, I don't know, I just don't know how I feel about it just in terms of it just makes it vague and that's an argumentative point of there's no kids congregating there, so that's not it. But the night before there were kids congregating there, so I don't know, I just, I would rather see it, I'd rather see our public hearing first and then do this. Okay, Councillor Bennett. I, I really sympathize uh, with Councillor on that. Uh, the problem we've got is uh, we, ha we don't have an ordinance yet that reflects where the city council is on this. And we only have right now scheduled one meeting left to deal with this. It'll be a public hearing, second reading, and this thing's going to start moving. And we, uh, Councillor Bernards and I were talking about it, and it's a uh, uh, we, we've got a time constraint. We had to pass through last time because there just wasn't a way to talk about it. This is our way to kind of mold this thing and let staff uh, and the public know kind of at least generally, and I think actually pretty specifically, where we're going to be on this. So when they come to testify, they're testifying on kind of what, what's actually on the table. And that doesn't mean you can't change it. Mm -hmm. uh, on the 22nd, you can offer amendments then as well, but it would be, this just gives everybody kind of, I think, a real understanding of generally, if not specifically, where we are. So they can testify. And uh, in listening tonight uh, to the public comment, we've had a lot of public comment from, particularly from proponents on this, but 
there are there are things inside of this that you know probably ought to be fixed or at least understood before we get there. I, I think this I, just you know really seriously. I think this is okay. I think. Uh, in a perfect world, we'd have months to do this stuff. We, haven't, we aren't in a perfect world right now, and this is a fairly difficult issue that has been looked at and looked at, and I think uh, what we're trying to do is get something sort of solid on the table. Councilor Kloss, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, and I respect that. Um, if I could have the staff help me out. October 27th, what's the magic of that? Was that set by council? October 27th is the uh, expiration of the uh, moratorium. Council imposed moratorium. Correct. That's the date set by council of October 27th. Uh, I just, if it's such a big deal, I just hate making us, making ourselves go faster than we need to go. So part of what's where I'm coming from. So I'm okay with it. I don't have a problem with the idea of getting something on the street that's a little closer to what council wants, but at the same time, I don't want to push something forward too fast or faster than we need to just because we set a date of October 27th and now we're getting it back two meetings before that date. Um, I don't know how fair that is to everybody in the community, but maybe it's good because it is going forward. I don't really know, to be totally honest. So uh, just thinking out loud as we discuss this and as we move it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nanke and then Councillor Benares. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, and, and our time crunch is self-imposed and we could always Shut. We wanted to make sure that we did something in, a, in an expedient fashion. Um, and so we put an aggressive date on um, the moratorium. Um, that being said, we had the, uh, the interesting meeting where we were trying to figure out what to put in. <laughs> um, and, and we're at that point now. Depending on what we do here tonight, it may be uh, we can't come to any agreement on certain pieces here. I was actually surprised to see a couple in here, and I'll be making a motion to remove them. Um, but this is where we start winnowing that down. If we can't hit that, we can always move that date out. But, you know, we should get on with at least the process. And if we're not all in agreement, that'll show, and we can have more discussion on it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Benares. I am absolutely in agreement with that. I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable. This is the first basically week we've had to look at staff, the staff's recommendation. I would much prefer to extend out the moratorium another two to four weeks just to make sure that we get this right. It doesn't feel right that we do a first reading tonight. We hash through it with amendments. Then we do the second reading and we vote on it in the next meeting without having a fair, a fair amount of time to come up before the public and a fair amount of time of digesting exactly what's here because there are a lot of little tidbits. There are major ones there, but there's tidbits that we need to work through. Um, I know one of the big things being on the committee that, that, that at least came up with some recommendations. The big one is, at least our discussion was locations or setbacks, basically. And there, I see the same thing in here tonight. And I think that needs needs time to be flushed out. So I would support extending the moratorium time period, doing giving this process of figuring out the details now that we have a framework to work with uh, and let, let, let things work themselves out and not rush it. Councillor Clem followed by Councillor Tesler. Yes, and I, I appreciate the discussion. I feel like we're just now getting into it. Mm -hmm. And that was really the reason for offering the motions. Let's, let's get into it and then let the public react to what we're thinking. Everybody is wondering what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. So let's get it out. And, and it isn't to rush anything. Yeah, we can change the deadline. Of course we can. But we keep moving deadlines. It's like kicking around the parking can. You know, it, it's, uh, let's get it done and over with and give the public certainty, particularly the patients. And so really, I, I, I fully agree that it's coming to us real fast. I'm sorry, but we've had six months. Uh, you, you know, how long it's going to take for you to regulate one business permit. So I, I appreciate the frustration or the concern, but I put my motions out there well in advance so that we could at least get the conversation sort of started. So it's in that vein of let's get on with it that I offer my second motion and that's to add a new section three to the ordinance to state what I've typed and sent out to everybody. It's also public record, but it really in, a, in, a, in summary fashion uh, amends and adds to the ordinance uh, for those facilities operated in compliance with the moratorium established by ordinance 4-14 earlier this year. They shall be res reviewed and a decision shall be issued before apl other applications may be considered. 
I'm going to stop for a moment and go back as a courtesy because Councillor Tesler had her hand up and I know she wanted oh, to I'm make sorry. some comment and I'm sorry but I wanted, didn't quickly enough get that in. Councillor Tesler. Actually, I came here tonight to do business. And it's time to fish or cut bait, and I'm totally in agreement with, with Dan. I mean, I'm here to tell you what I think, and I've got something to say. I'll tell you, so let's just do it. <laughs> all right, I see <laughs> Councillor Clausen's hand up. Thank you. I, yes. I'm all about hearing what everybody has to say, because as everybody said, and as Councillor Clem just said, this is our first time seeing it. So we should discuss it. We should make amendments to it. We should put it out for public hearing, and then we should vote at least one meeting later. I'm totally okay making amendments tonight, as long as we at least have the general understanding that there's a real good chance we're going to go out at least one more meeting, because I don't think it's fair to put it out to the public two weeks beforehand and then say, hey, we're going to vote on it, so you better get in here right away. Uh, two, two, quick, two quick points, if I may. Uh, first, the schedule for this is tentatively set for first reading tonight, public hearing on September 22nd, second reading October 13th. So at the evening of the public hearing on the 22nd, you'll have an opportunity to hear testimony and make further amendments, and that'll, those will be engrossed for second reading on the 13th. Okay. Second point is that, yes, you can most likely continue the moratorium. I've told you that a few times. The counter argument is that, which some folks in the audience have raised previously, is that you had a, a one-time chance to set the moratorium back in March, and now you can't extend it. I don't subscribe to that argument, but it, it has been raised. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I'd like to hear the motion again, just so I can make sure I sure. understood it. All right, so we're, we're now going to hear the motion from Councillor Clem, his second amendment to the motion, correct, Councillor Clem? That's correct, Was Madam that right? Mayor. Okay, thank you. thank you. I move that we engross the ordinance to add a new section to the ordinance to state, and I've provided you email copy of the entire paragraph, but I'll summarize it by saying, um, that an application from a facility operated in compliance with the moratorium established in ordinance 4-14 shall be reviewed and a decision shall be issued before other applications may be considered. All right, is there a second? second. It's seconded by Councillor Clam. Moved by Councillor Clam, seconded by Councillor Bennett to add a new section uh, that has to do with the application from a facility would be considered after the other facilities applications have been considered and is there discussion thank you Councillor Clem and then Councillor Nanke thank you Madam Mayor um, this is not a preference it's not a grandfather it is an actual uh, um, honoring of the fact that the, most of the facilities have been operating uh, under the moratorium to state law uh, under um, Oregon Health Authority and that uh, there haven't been complaints. And so it makes sense that we, we don't get into a, a, a sticky situation where we want to prefer them, but we don't want to get into a sticky situation where somebody else who walks in five minutes before one of these applicants walks in doesn't find themselves restricted by other portions of the ordinance. And because the ordinance is restrictive, uh, I mean in its current form, depending on how we amend it, but it, it is restrictive, and so it's really in that, in that honoring of the investments that have already been made by, by operators who've been operating well as businesses, as, as bona fide businesses, that we at least, they get a, a, a shot at getting their licenses in a timely manner, um, and then let the marketplace and, and the ordinance uh, speak to what the competition looks like. But, uh, for those that have been operating properly, I think they should have a shot at first application. All right, uh, Councillor Nanke, I believe you had your hand up. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Mayor, and it's a, more of a question of the uh, maker of the motion in regards to um, how the amendment would read if we were in fact to remove the, uh, the caps on the number of facilities in town, and is this essentially to address that? Um, <laughs> issue okay. is that the end of your comment it, it's, it's essentially a question a question of about the maker of the motion through the chair mm -hmm. for clarification <laughs> purposes councillor Clem. It, 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 the intent of this motion is not to change the caps is to leave the caps but in fact because the cap is there it makes sense that the folks who are already operating get a, at least a first shot at the license so it retains the cap and and the rationale that was provided 
in the ordinance you know, was enough for me to understand that I think it would be one facility for every 500 patients. So yeah. I, again, I, I'm not speaking to the cap. I'm speaking to the fact that most of these folks have been operating. Um, let, let's allow them to continue, particularly if they're doing it under the moratorium. Is there any further discussion? All right, call for the question on the motion. The motion was made by Councillor Clem and seconded by Councillor Bennett to add a new section having to do with the applications for um, from new facilities and their um, priority, uh, that, the, that the existing facilities have priority before the new applicants are considered. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously, thank you. And I believe, Councillor Clem, you said you had a third item? I do, thank All you, right. Madam Mayor. Uh -huh. Also provided for in the email that I sent out uh, last Thursday to you, would be to engross ordinance 17-14 uh, to amend the proposed SRC 31090B3 as follows. Amend subsection E to state, 100 feet of a residentially zoned property unless the location of the facility abuts a major arterial as that term is defined by the Salem Transportation System Plan and to add a subsection F to say 100 feet of a crossed out or certified child care facility is determined by the by the Oregon Department of Human Services. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Councillor Clem and seconded by Councillor Benars to amend the motion to add um, wording having to do with the distance of 100 feet from a residential facility and et cetera. So is there discussion on your motion, Councillor Clem? Thank you, Madam Mayor. As also provided in the email, licensed facilities under this ordinance are operating as commercial enterprises generally found in major arterials. We should retain the 100-foot buffer from presidential property where these licensed facilities so as not to allow commercial activities and negatively affect quiet neighborhoods. However, in most instances where residentially zoned properties exist near major arterials, as was one of the commenters shared with us, potential negative impacts have already been or likely can be mitigated. Um, uh, again, uh, protect the neighborhoods. Um, but if it's commercial property on an arterial right next to a neighborhood, pretty much that's already in effect right now. So this just aligns the ordinance to make that clear. And uh, I think the staff is prepared to discuss what the major arterials look like. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. I, I had a question, Madam Mayor, uh, of the maker of the motion. I want to understand better the child care center portion of this. I, I don't have any problem right now with what you're describing with the arterials, but I'm not sure I understood the child care portion. It, Madam Mayor, if I yes, can sir. clarify that, that was just to renumber that section. There, right now, the 100-foot buffer requirement groups in the uh, residential zone property and the, and the child care facility create a 100-foot buffer between both. So uh, Councillor Clem's motion just basically breaks those out into two separate subsections. So it doesn't change the 100-foot the buffer for a child care facility. Who's 100-foot buffer? Who's the staff or the state? Yes. This is a staff this, recommendation. This is a staff recommendation. And I just want to understand, because this is, you've, you've got it in your motion. And I'm trying to understand this child care center. Uh, anyone can open a child care center. And is, does this resolve that problem where I've got a business going and a child care center moves within 100 feet of me, gets their license, do I close my business? Um. Madam Mayor, um, if you look at subsection C, which is uh, z uh, 31090, it states that, uh, or excuse me, not, s not C, but D. It says that, basically it states that if, a, if one of these affected properties, such as a child care center, opens up after you get your license, it doesn't require you to close and it doesn't okay. prohibit you from getting renewed. Okay. My intent was a renumbering. I wasn't to change that. Well, it, it's just part of your motion includes their idea. And I want to understand what their idea is. That makes sense to me. I just, I'm trying to understand 
uh, the child care issue because I think it's it's far more complicated than I think it's being let on. If I can add another clarification. Not by you. <laughs> You're just being real straight. So the, the, this refers to a certified uh, child care facility. These are specific types of child care facilities that go through a state certification process. Not every house with you know three kids being babysat qualifies for that so it's a specific subset that um, that the state actually keeps a registry of so we can actually track it as opposed to every little daycare or every little uh, babysitting operation is okay. set up for um, okay councillor Benars I uh, I personally struggle with the second part of that motion I, I can certainly support the hundred feet from residentially zoned and abutting major arterial but I have mentioned this before on this floor, it, it, whether you're 100 feet, so imagine this, you, you're a facility, you're 101 feet away from uh, child care, which means if this goes through, you're illegal and you can, you can work and dispense medical marijuana. An individual comes in, buys that marijuana, drives 101 feet or 100 feet and 11 and a half inches right next door to a daycare facility and they can consume it in the privacy of their own home. I mean, it's illegal to do it in public. Um, it doesn't prevent really the children from being exposed in essence so i could support the first half of the motion i would really prefer to get rid of the second half is there further discussion councillor clem yes madam mayor um i would restate my motion to to remove the daycare uh, my intent was not to create a separate two arguments one motion the idea was to create one argument point of discussion in the motion and so I would, I would restate it uh, to not include the subsection F, and uh, we can take that up separately, if the second will support that. Yeah. So to, to, to clarify that you would be removing the 100-foot buffer requirement between child care facilities. Yeah. It would no. just be adding that portion to E that would deal with the uh, arterials. arterials. And leave the rest in. We'll leave the rest in there and, and yeah. we can discuss that separately. Exactly. Is that kind of clear, Kathy? Or okay. Councillor Clement, would you like to restate your motion? Sure. Okay. I'll restate to engross or I think that would be good. Re restate it to engross okay. ordinance bill number seventeen dash fourteen to um, Amend proposed SRC 31090B3 as follows. Amend subsection E to state 100 feet of a residentially zoned property unless that location of the facility abuts a major arterial is that term is defined in the same transportation system plan. All right. Is there further discussion regarding that amendment? <coughs> Councilor Clausen. Just a quick question. Is that a do we have other situations in our zoning code where something like that applies where we have a buffer typically but then not a buffer on an arter arterial? Does that make sense? Or is this a unique type situation? I, uh, I'm uh, Glenn Gross. I'm the Community Development Director. I don't recall I can't a think standard anything else that's that relates to an arterial, no. So I think this would be unique. Uh, as far as I can recall, I, uh, you know, offhand. Okay. Yeah. No, just strip <coughs> Clem? Yes, I would make a um, comment that th this entire subject is unique. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're issuing yeah. a business license permit. We we don't do that in the city of Salem normally. So, you know, we are coming up against issues that we probably haven't dealt with before. But I think we can assure the neighbors, the neighborhoods, that we don't intend for this activity to impact the quiet neighborhoods and so that's the intent of the motion we're in new ground here so is there further discussion regarding that third motion councilor rogers uh maybe staff w wouldn't uh, most arterials have a commercial designation is, is that fair <laughs> Well, it wouldn't necessarily be commercial. It could be industrial. It could be high-density residential. So um, I think it's safe to say that, that uh, it's going to be some high-intensity land use, but it's not necessarily going to be commercial. If I can clarify. 
Yes. So this this motion wouldn't basically allow a dispensary to locate upon any major arterial. They'd still have to meet the the other requirements of the ordinance, which requires it to be commercially zoned. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion on the third motion? All right. We'll call for the question. And the motion was made by Councillor Clem. And who seconded that motion? Councillor Bennett. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Did everybody vote on that? All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. That passed unanimously. We'll now go on to Ordinance 8. What? To no. No. Oh, no. no. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Councilor Dickey. No. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> We're just getting started here. Just trying to move along. Just trying to get it going. Let's go to Mayor's items. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, You're welcome. Yes, I also have a motion. All right. I move to engross Ordinance Bill 17-14 to amend the application and renewal fee to from $4,000 to $1,000. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Dickey and seconded by Councillor Tesler to amend the uh, motion to allow for an, a fee of $1,000 rather than $4,000. Is there discussion? Councillor Dickey. Yes, thank you. Um, and, and I appreciate um, staff kind of putting some stuff together to kind of guess at what um, the cost would be. I know this is this is all very new, very unique for us. So, um, but let me explain to you why I am proposing this. Um, $4,000 to me seems a little bit punitive in terms of I, I think that's that is a very high number um, when I looked at so what the the health authority is charging four thousand dollars and and given some of the testimony tonight I'm not quite clear on um, what their actual costs are although um, one of the things is I believe the health authority employees are located in Portland which means that if they have to go and inspect a dispensary say somewhere in southern Oregon or eastern Oregon or somewhere else there's going to be significantly higher costs associated with that inspection than um, if they were just doing it locally um, which could drive that cost a little bit higher. Another thing is, I um, in my employment, the office I work in, um, we inspect tobacco shops, hookah shops, and that kind of thing. We do it once a year. Um, it, it, you know, we're we're not anywhere near, you know, a half time position to be able to do that. Um, I, you know, it seems like we could, if if a thousand dollars isn't um, seems not enough to do as many inspections as staff is recommending, they could decrease the number of inspections that they're doing. Um, they could work within that. And at the, uh, by the same token, if um, the $1,000, it seems like um, the costs are coming in higher, staff can come back to us in six months or in a year and say, you know, these are what our actual costs were. And so we would like to amend this ordinance. Um, so I, I feel like $1,000 is a good starting point. It's a good midpoint for it. I believe it'll give the city some resources to be able to conduct their activities and do their inspections and that kind of thing, but isn't um, doesn't feel punitive to the businesses. Um, and, and I also look at some of the other businesses that we have that you know, we that have licenses, we don't charge anywhere near this much money. And I know it's a different kind of a model, I understand, you know, we're not conducting the same kinds of inspections or that kind of thing. Um, but I think that this, this is a good middle ground for us to be able to start on. And, you know, we can move up or down from there. At, at, but they could also, staff could come back to us and say, hey, it's not costing us this much to administer this. Um, we could lower the fee as well. So um, that's how I came up with $1,000. Councilor Tesler. Uh, question to the maker of the motion. Does this $1,000 include the audit fee? I, you know, I, I think that's a good question. I did not ask when I asked staff if the, that audit fee was included in the inspections or how many times, I, and I apologize if I didn't see it in here, how many times a year they 
would intend to audit financially? Because I believe the health authority is already doing that. That's correct. So I, you know, I don't know that if we necessarily need to do that or need to do that, you know, what, what was it, two or three inspections a year? I, I'm not sure. So um, I, I would say that should include the audit fee. Yeah. Thank you. Further discussion? Councilor Clem. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not supportive of an amount that's much below even what our police costs are. I'm concerned that um, we aren't, I absolutely agree with Councilor Dickey that the intent of this is not to be punitive. The city has to run programs. This program's being added. There's gotta be some minimal cost recovery. If it's half a police officer, that's $75,000, $80,000. That's much beyond what staff's re recommended in the four. I'd be happier with a $2,000 fee. And then, you know, if we don't, if our, with a report that if the costs are lower than that, attributable police time costs, you know, that we would lower that. But we're asking the police chief with a limited amount of officers, particularly officers patrolling downtown, now to take on sort of this fiscal an inspection program. I, I just want to make sure at least we can cover some basic costs there. So I, I, uh, I, I would make a plea that we at least recover some of our costs with 2,000. 1,000 is seriously, from what's been presented, too low in terms of us being able to run the program. Our ability to raise fees later, that's always an interesting question. <laughs> it, it is always met with this fraught fear and, and, and negativity that you're hiking us. So I, I would rather work with the industry over a year's period, revisit this, and then come back with adjusting the fee downward or upward as it needs to be. But I, 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 I would look that we would vote on something at about the $2,000 level, and that that would include the audit fee. And then, you know, after the first year, uh, a report back on on what the costs were attributable to the budget and then adjust after that. But I think we, we need to go into this knowing that we're not losing money right from day zero. So I would appreciate the maker of the motion considering an amendment to $2,000. Uh, Councillor Dickey and then Councillor Rogers and Councillor Benars, did you just have your hand up too? All right, thank you. Councillor Dickey, all right. And then I'm gonna get in line, so I'll go behind <laughs> Councillor Tesler. All right, Councillor right. Dickey. Thank you. Um, one, one question I had or I thought I had is, um, I understand that the police department would be the ones doing the inspections. I'm wondering why we don't have um, non-sworn officers. Is that because, or is there some restriction in the amendment that would only allow for that? I mean, we have code enforcement that goes out and does all sorts of inspections and enforcement. Is there a particular reason or is that just what staff landed on was to have the police do it. Yes, serious reason and Chief Moore can address that. Well, I think this is a little different than anything code enforcement would uh, investigate. As uh, Councilor Bennett indicated, this is a, a felony under federal law and I think it, it should remain in, uh, in the scope of what police officers are involved in. Yes, Councilor Dickey. Yeah, and then also just to um, address Councilor Clem's um, consideration of $2,000. You know, I, I think that, you know, we're losing money if we, um, off the bat, if, you know, we follow the particular schedule that's been outlined, but we could also work within that budget and um, develop an inspection schedule that would fit within that budget as well. So um, I think it could go either way. Councilor Tesler. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna support an increase over $1,000. I, you know, I, when you think that, you know, a, a bar can get a protective license for $75, is that correct? Or a taxi driver company can get a license for $250, something in that neighborhood. And I think about how many times the police go to bars, especially ones that um, we begged OLCC to shut down because we had years of problems there. I'm trying to see how we recovered our $75. Our $75. And the police were there constantly, constantly. And I don't, this is a, to me, this is very, very unfair. Very unfair. And I, I can't, I cannot support, this is a new thing, it's a paradigm shift. I get that. I understand this is on the, the edge for a lot of people. I understand that too. 
But you know, I'm here speaking for my consist constituency. You have to hold people down to get them to complain about that. I don't hear about it. It's not a problem from what I hear from people. I don't understand why I would ask somebody for $2,000 for something that the state already does. We pay that for that. That's, this is duplication of efforts. I cannot support it. I, the work group came up with $1,000. I wouldn't have even came up with that. But you came up with $1,000, and I think that you think that's fair, and I'll support $1,000. But I'm not going to support a penny more, because this is not take advantage of, of people in this situation. And that's what I'm feeling like when it goes over $1,000. And you know, I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I'll just put that out there. Councilor Rogers, I believe you were next. I'm almost afraid to after that. <laughs> Not really. No. Um, what what would community development fee be? Is that just to check the zoning? Is that what would happen because this is a license and it's um, not a permit? That, that primarily would be what they would do, and then any consultation with the police department. Okay. Now, if a developer comes into the city with a plan, they go to community development, and you have a fee. Y yes, they get it. They pay a fee for. Uh, permit review and planning review and building and safety review. This is a different situation. I get it. it. This is a license. Yeah. I get that. But yeah. I'm just trying to see what the extent of their activity is in the process. How much time are they going to spend looking at a street and see whether it's an arterial or whether the zoning is commercial? Yeah. I, th I think the part that community development and planning will spend will be um, probably measuring, I mean, the distance, and can you just speak to that, Mr. Yes, Chris? I can. It would be determining the zoning, determining the buffer width, if it falls within the buffer area, that sort of thing. Answering questions, uh, questions from both people that want to open a dispensary, plus questions from people that live near a dispensary and, you know, from, 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 the, from the public in general. We don't know how many questions we're going to get, how much time we're going to spend. We'll have to kind of see how it unfolds, but it would be those kinds of questions. Yeah. Well, if I may comment on the question here, uh, I, I don't believe in duplicating services either from the state and the city. I just, I don't get that at any level. And, and uh, it doesn't mean we don't have to be accountable. It, and again, it doesn't mean we're not going to have responsibilities. Um, and I don't think the estimate we have is any better than the thousand dollars or the four thousand? I don't think we know where to land, and and I think no matter where we go, as long as we review it and c and identify what our costs are as we go, then we can come back and say this is what it should be in the future. So I could land anywhere, I guess. What I'm trying to say, but I, I want to be fair to the people uh, because it's to me it's a business, you know, and it's going to provide jobs in this community and all that. So I just. I just don't like the duplication either. So I'm with you. Thank you. Well, I will speak to the motion. I'm not going to support the motion. I would not support a fee under $4,000. And I've given this a great deal of thought. And I've read through the ordinance. And I think that we really need to remember that we're talking about asking uh, a department, in this case the police department, to inspect something that, and, and they're charged with protecting the public health, safety, and the welfare. This is not an inspection of a plumbing shop to make sure you've got so many hammers and so many pipes. This is an inspection of a facility that handles a drug that we know is traded illegally in the community, and why is that? We know it's a drug that's highly sought after. We know there's crime that surrounds that drug. And we know that that fuels a lot of our police services every day. Now it's going to become available for a limited number of people in a limited circumstance, and yet it is the same product. And my concern is that we're asking our community to trust that we're going to regulate an environment in which that drug is distributed. And I would like to be certain that the city of Salem is able to establish the kinds of rules, procedures, processes, standards, and documentation so that all of us can be assured 
that those drugs are being properly, that that drug is being properly housed, cared for, and distributed. And the other part of this is that that drug is going to create tremendous income to the facilities. We all know that. And that's another issue. If we're supposed to be actually auditing, I'm not certain that two people from the state of Oregon are going to audit correctly all around the state. So I don't want to, in any case, um, give up our right to audit and to carefully monitor these businesses because two people from the state of Oregon are supposed to be out there doing it for us. I don't think that what we're talking about here is duplication of services. I think we're talking about trying to set up an, uh, an organization and standards that truly do protect the health, the safety, and the welfare. And we know already we're in a deficit situation as far as, excuse me, the emotion in my voice, as far as the cost of even examining this new enterprise in our community. We've spent hundreds of hours, administrative hours, law enforcement hours, council time, to bring this ordinance to this point. And I think we have to look at the cost of that. And I would like to think that $4,000 might cover all of the costs that we're going to incur. If indeed we find that it's way more than we should receive, then I would be willing after a year to come back and examine those records and examine the time and the effort and adjust it. But I know if we set it too low, we'll never be able to set it properly. So I will not support the motion. Councillor Benars. <laughs> I too will not be supporting the motion. I think it should stay at the, th the 4,000 for the time being. The information that I've been given from staff, very knowledgeable about the things that go on and the costs that are there associated with, this, with staff's time. I've just been through a lot of different budget processes. I'm, I've got people asking for streetlight fees and, and, and parking fees because parking isn't free and streetlights aren't free and street maintenance isn't free. And staff time is expensive. And professional, the professional level staff time of the police officers, I mean, you know, all the training and all the efforts they have to go through just to get that, just the overhead portion of that thing, not to mention what they're going to be doing just for this particular program. I would support keeping the $4,000 permit fee this year and then reassessing before the end of next year, before the end of 15, um, a staff report that would say, did we do, did we hit the number correctly? Is it high? Is it low? And reassess at that point. But up to this point, the information that I've been given from staff, from the people who know, uh, say that a $4,000 fee is a fair fee. And I wanted to mention one little thing. From what I, what little I know about this, about the, the business of uh, medical marijuana, I believe that there's actually not that much money to be made. There'll be a lot of money exchanging hands because of the cost of the product. But I believe by state law, they're not supposed to charge anything more than what it costs to actually produce and sell the product. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. Councillor Bennett. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of uh, thinking about the discussion, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of of two minds as to how to, how to proceed on this issue. One is to set it aside till next time and let people sit down with their slide rules and figure out the economics of marijuana, the cost of a police officer, and put it all together. But uh, the other in me uh, is I, I really take the advice of the chief, and I, I think I'd, I'd prefer to split the difference. And, and uh, Madam Mayor, I move to amend the amendment uh, to uh, two thousand dollars. Second. Was that Clem who seconded? Yes. Okay. That was Clem. Madam Mayor, I, I okay. would you like to speak to your motion. Yeah, I already okay. did, but I'll stag, stag talk all day. I'm starting to run oh, out yeah. of patience, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think we're. Uh, I don't know what the right number is. I think it probably is going to be in excess of two thousand dollars. That is my sense of the costs, uh, and I think there are uh, associated issues with this industry which go beyond patient provider. They go into another realm and it's the concern I think we all have in dealing with a product that has uh, been so long illegal and on the black market. 
but I'd like to go back. I, I'd like to see what the costs look like dealing with that kind of gray market that's gone on over the past couple of years with growers and smoke shops and all this other stuff that's been going on in town because uh, I don't know what that cost looked like and that was pretty clearly kind of edgy. This is a little more straightforward, quite a bit more straightforward, but um, to keep moving it along, I'd like to get it to $2,000 and then if we want to talk about it again, do it again. I mean, I'm open to talking about it further. I just like to get done with this part of it and move ahead and get enough votes to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think at 2000, we might be able to get enough votes to move ahead and then we can talk about it again in two weeks. Councillor Chesler and then Councillor Nankin. For the sake of moving it ahead and getting a compromise together, I will I don't like it, but I will support the $2,000. I just would really like to see a very itemized list. We asked for this during the work group and it was and staff was unable to produce it then. Um, I still don't see, I, I just don't, I don't feel comfortable with these numbers that have been tossed out. I, I'm sorry, it's not that I don't trust you. It's just, I do, I need a list, an Excel spreadsheet that says duh, duh, duh. It could not, it was not produced last time. It was not produced in our packet. It was not given to me before this meeting. It was asked for, it was not produced. I need that. Well, my response to that is that I, I think that what you're asking for is really the police department and the city administration to develop the standards and the processes and the procedures and the documentation that it will take to properly inspect the facilities and that's exactly what I'm talking about as a very expensive system and so in order to even estimate what we're going to be doing we first of all I think need to establish the system I'm not even sure that we know what that is yet and maybe we shouldn't be talking about a price at all tonight that's a thought you know Councilor Nanke Thank you, Madam Mayor. And those fees always come up by resolution as well in other situations, uh, which is where they're housed. But the fee depends on what it is we want them to actually end up doing as far as number of inspections. What's the state's checklist on inspections? Are we going to be doing the same thing again, which is duplicative, but we're going to be doing it twice while they do it once every year? Um, and then we also have the issue of, uh, of auditing books that the state will already be auditing their books. Um, which I, they'll catch anything in the books. So, I mean, worst case, in a one-year interval, as they come, if we are guaranteed that they will inspect each of these facilities in the state every year, those pieces should be picked up. So, um, and that will all manifest itself in what the, the cost is, but we're kind of not at that piece of it. We're, we're attacking the entirety of this from different angles as was you know made with I'm first in the application process well I'm going to make a motion that may make that pseudo moot as well um, depending on if we get extensions to move past 10 o'clock is we still <laughs> got a long way to go. Councillor Clem I saw your hand and then Councillor Dickey. Thank you uh, Madam Mayor and uh, I, I, I join with other councilors who, who want to get this out, let the public react to it. I think at the public hearing, it would be great if staff could provide in writing um, some estimate of costs. But I think in the spirit of moving ahead and having that information come forward via a public hearing so everybody can see it, I, that's why I support the 2000. You know what, we could change it. We've got two more opportunities to do that. There's always resolution schedules, but I think staff's aware that we want to see something in writing in terms of estimate on community development. You know what? We trust you with so many other estimates and 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 staff recommendations, 100% of them. That I think if you at least be able to estimate, um, we can go from there, Madam Mayor. But I would encourage that we. I think we have other issues to discuss with regard to this ordinance and for the, in the spirit of moving ahead, we set it at least what our minimal costs are to the police department, that's $2,000. Well, I'd like to offer an amended motion to um, 
to eliminate from this draft of the ordinance any dollar figure for inspections and instead ask staff to come back with their best estimate as to uh, even if it's a range of what the um, inspection fee should be at the time that they're able to actually give us a list Madam, or a description. Madam Mayor, before yes, you make that motion, that? there's already an amended motion on the table, so we need to consider that first. All right. And the amended motion is for $2,000, and that was made by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Clem. All right, then Councillor Dickey. Can I make a comment about yes. Councillor Bennett's motion? All right, thanks. Um, I, you know, I don't particularly like the $2,000, but I will support it um, in the effort of moving things along. I, I, I will say to staff that um, I, you know, I, when I said that at the health department at our office, we inspect hookah shops and tobacco shops and that kind of thing, we ha it comes from the health authority. I mean, we've got a template that we use, a process that we follow. So um, I would hope that staff could go to the health authority and kind of find out, you know, get, I'm sure they'd be happy to share some of their information of how they actually do this. That might be very helpful. Um, I, I guess I thought maybe we had asked for that in the task force. I thought maybe that had already been done, that the health authority had been contacted. Um, but maybe, I, I don't know, maybe they didn't get back to you, or I, I'm not really sure. But I thought we had discussed that. I'm not recalling completely. Um, you know, and I would say, too, I mean, I just heard on the radio today that the health authority shut down nine dispensaries. That means they're doing some inspections. They're doing something somewhere in, in different parts of the state. So. Um, we do know that they are doing their job, um, and so we don't, we don't need to be duplicating what they're doing. We have some of our own rules. Absolutely, we need to make sure that our own rules are being followed. So um, I, I think 2,000 is actually too much, but you know, we, we do have to land somewhere and kind of figure out, um, and I would really like to see that accounting for how, you know, how we would intend to um, spend that $2,000, because we can also create a program to meet that $2,000 rather than just going on our own and then saying, oops, we spent more than that or whatever. Councilor Benars. I said I was pretty adamant about the 4,000, and then yet on the same time I recognize that this is a work in progress um, where, whereby I'm expecting, really I'm expecting to see a staff report come to us before the next uh, council meeting so that we have an idea of exactly where we are in the cost of things. And I don't want to have just simply the hours that are, that are put in per, per, but there's, you know, there's overhead costs that have to be associated with that, and that needs to be in the consideration as well. Uh, we've got to keep these people on staff all the time, even though only part of the time they're going to be working with the dispensaries. So I will, I will defer and support the, the motion amendment of $2,000 with the caveat that I really am expecting staff report, a good staff report on that. Well, I, I will continue to not support the $2,000 figure. Um, and I, I would say that I, I strongly suggest that our council give serious consideration to the, the complacency that I hear tonight to abdicate our responsibility that we have for local control and local oversight, and we're going to hand that off to the state that we know has two people doing inspections for the entire state of Oregon. And I just encourage you to remember that we have a community that looks to us to maintain the health, the safety, and the welfare of this community not to abdicate that to two people who've been allocated by the state of Oregon to do something that I think is in our best interest to do ourselves and to do it well. Be that as it may, we have a motion on the floor. I believe the number is $2,000 as, as um, amended. Did that amendment also indicate uh, a requirement, oh, excuse me, Councillor Bennett, yes. to come back in one year's time and reevaluate that amount? Uh, or not? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, it can come back. I would have it back in six months and reevaluate. Six months? Yeah, All right. I mean, six I, months. or two months. I, we, I would just expect at some point we will ask the staff to give us a report. But I hadn't thought about it in the amendment. But yeah, what do you think? Six? Yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. six months gives enough okay. time to get a, a sense of it. Chief, do you agree with that? Well, I think six months minimally. Uh, because uh, if, if we have eight to 10 dispensaries or 12 
Uh, I think it's in a two month period, we're, we're not going to get to them all. No. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. And all if, right. If six months doesn't work, we'll extend it to a year. I mean, I'm not too concerned. I, it's just to, I hadn't thought about it. Okay. I don't think we're done with this yet. No. <laughs> Councillor Clausen. Thank you. When, would this fall under the normal budgetary fee schedules that we see at budget session? That's when we would see these coming back, so it would be one of the fees in the schedules. Yes, actually the ordinance doesn't contain a dollar figure for the fee, so we set by council resolution. So oh, what we do based on this amendment is just put a provision in the ordinance that says the fee will be $2,000. Reviewed annually? Yeah. Yes. And is that the annual part in there right now? I don't, I didn't, I don't know. Fee, fee resolutions are set annually, so yes, it would come back every year for you. Okay. But could we require a different timing? Yes. Okay. All right. Six months or a year? Six months. Okay. All right. <laughs> going, going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I believe that the motion on the floor addresses the um, inspection fee at $2,000 uh, annually, but to be a, a, a re-examined after six months. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The uh, Main motion um, included the audit fee in that, so I suppose the question would be is does the uh, substitute also include the audit fee as well? Yeah, as all I was going after was the number. That's all I was changing was the number coming from the counselor to 2000. So I, if hers had the audit fee, mine has the audit fee. The, and the second concurs. Yeah. All right. All right, as I remember, the motion on the floor was made by Councillor Dickey and seconded by Councillor Clem. Call for the question. On the amendment. Of, oh, the, man, of the amended motion. No, motion, the main, yes. Or the main amendment. We need to vote on, vote on the amendment. Voting on the amendment. Right. Amendment to 2000. Right. Okay. Councillor Dickey, would you like to restate your motion for clarity? I see a lot of uh, finger pointing back here. <laughs> Let's are just be sure. Are we voting on my motion no. or yes. we're Councilor voting on Bennett's Councilor motion. Bennett's motion? Yes, yeah. yeah, substitute. Substitute motion. All right. Oh, I'll wait a moment. Okay. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Substitute motion, just vote on Bennett's motion, then you're done. That's fine. Well, no, then there may be more motions, but we're done with the issue of the fee. Well, All right, we, we are going to call it an amended motion. <laughs> okay. All right, the motion on the floor, call for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion passes and Anna Peterson votes no. Thank you. All right, is there another motion on this is item? Else have come. I believe, Councillor Dickey, did you have did you want to make another motion on this issue? Okay, okay, thank you. Councillor Tesler. <laughs> yeah, not <now>. Yeah. <laughs> She's good. Um, <laughs> now it's my turn. Um, I move to engross and amend uh, 1714 to uh, amend uh, the proposed SRC 30. I would like to change the hours from 10 to 8 and not 10 to 7. Second. Thank you. And the second part of my motion is to reduce the distance from parks from 1,000 feet to 500. Okay, I'll just do one. One issue at a time. That's okay. the first one. Would, it, is there a second? Second. It's been moved by Councillor Tesler and yeah. seconded by Councillor Clem. Thank you. Councillor Tesler, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, yeah, I really don't care what the city of Kaiser does. Um, I really <laughs> care what the city of Salem does. And we should do what we would like to do and what works for the business people in our community. And that's what I heard that 10 to 8 works best. And that's what we should do. Is there further discussion? All right, call for the question. It's been moved by Councillor Tesler and seconded by Councillor Clem to change the hours in the ordinance, in the draft of the ordinance, to change them to 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. 
Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And you had another motion? I do. Okay. Uh, I move to engross and amend 1714 to amend the proposed SR 30 from, I, want, I wish to reduce the distance from parks from 1,000 feet to 500 feet. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Chesler and seconded by Councillor Dickey to change the distance from 1,000 feet to 500 feet. Councillor Tesler, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you. Um, the statement was made that that affects two of the current business people, one of them in Ward 2. Um, I believe that that distance is sufficient to protect the people in the park from someone uh, illegally smoking marijuana in the park and if that is an issue it can be handled as it usually is handled by the police addressing the issue whether a facility was located a thousand five hundred or two miles from the park so that's why I wish to reduce that distance Did you ask yeah. just a, a quick comment on the some of those some of those setback distances were determined so they're consistent with the federal drug-free uh, school zone act it's not so much that that is a, a, a great piece of policy legislation it's that uh, a violation of that standard could lead to federal prosecution and the idea was to make our ordinance consistent with the federal standards so we're not licensing businesses that are possibly going to be prosecuted federally um, thank you and I appreciate that outlook and I find um, the gray area that currently exists to lead me to believe that that federal standard is really not inherent to the discussion at hand but thank you for that attempt to standardize. <laughs> Councillor Dickey. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, and I'm supporting this motion. One of the things that, as, and it came up tonight um, when the one dispensary owner spoke and um, said that her dispensary is just within a thousand feet of Bush Park. I know where that dispensary is. I was shocked actually to even learn that it was within that thousand feet. I mean, it's in a commercial area. It is. You know, you got across Commercial Street and Liberty Street. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't have guessed it was within a thousand feet. And so, you know, I think 500 feet kind of gets to the places where people congregate around parks if that's really the issue. Um, and I would also kind of point out, using that one as an example, um, should that dispensary not be allowed to operate, and it sounds like it's not now anyway, right next to that dispensary actually closer to commercial street so closer to bush park is um, a store where you can buy all sorts of paraphernalia paraphernalia to be able to um use the all sorts of illegal drugs if you want to and we have absolutely no regulations about that so i think we should keep that in mind as we talk about these kinds of setbacks is there further discussion Councillor Nanke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Do we currently have setbacks from parks um, in relationship to uh, strip clubs, for lack of a better, uh, and uh, drinking establishments? I don't know. That's my question. Was that a question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, we have we have a provision in the zoning code for um, establishments that have um, nighttime entertainment, essentially, um, to be located a certain distance from residential areas and um, schools. And I don't recall if it includes parks or not, but there 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 is a a provision that sets a a setback for those kinds of establishments. But not uh, normal bars? Not normal bars, in, in, the, in the sense that if there is no entertainment, uh, no. Right, because I, I know we had the one issue on commercial where we had a uh, religious facility down the street that didn't like having their sign right next to the other, and um, there were some other uh, child-sensitive receptors in that area as well. Uh, but I, I didn't recall parks being part of that either. Is there further comment? Councillor Quinn. Question. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Chief, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but um, in terms of the attendant issues that um, may spill over into a neighborhood, um, 
any rationale between the 500 feet and 1,000 feet in terms of your ability to to administer this ordinance if if passed? Uh, does it make any difference to you? Well, I think we're going to enforce it regardless of what it is, uh, whether it's 500 or 1,000. I think. Um, I think the basis of it was already discussed earlier tonight by many Better. councilors is that they don't know what the citizenry would want. And I think that was the reason for the setbacks. Not so much what the police department wants, but okay. what the community wants. All right, and I'm, I'd be supportive, again, to moving this forward for further discussion. If there are people and there is evidence that distancing from a park is it needs to be more than 500 feet, then we can have that discussion. But I'd, I'd support the 500 feet and let's, let's move this all right we have a motion on the floor the motion was made by uh, councillor tesler and seconded by councillor dickey to uh, change the distance uh, to amend the ordinance draft to change the distance from 1,000 feet to 500 feet are we ready for the question all those in favor of the of the motion signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. opposed say nay motion carries unanimously thank you was there another motion not from you, uh, <laughs> Councillor Benares. Thank you. I would like to make a motion uh, mo to move to amend engrossed ordinance bill number 17-14 by removing section 31.080. That is the section, I'll speak to it, it's the section uh, in reference to the limiting the number of dispensaries. Uh, it's my belief that it's a market, it should really should be market driven. Uh, whether there's too many already is already being borne out by those that have had to close. We'll see what happens and let the market prevail. That's what we do with everything else. It's been moved by Councillor Benars and seconded by Councillor Nanke to eliminate the section that specified the limit on the number of dispensaries. Is there further discussion? Councillor Bennett. Yeah, the only time, thank you, Madam Mayor, the only time I think this works is when you're you know, crabbing or fishing for tuna uh, to do limited entry. It really bothers me that we would try it on, try it on these dispensaries. I cannot make sense of that except that the people who own the dispensaries are moved to join the fishermen in having that kind of a market control system. And I don't think they get to do it in Salem. Try it in Astoria, but don't try it here. I don't think that's a, a good plan. Myself. Is there further discussion? All right, motion on the floor by, uh, made by um, Councilor Benars and seconded by Councilor Nanke to amend to remove the section regarding the cap on the number of dispensaries. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Benares. So before I make my next motion, I want to have a little discussion. It had, pertains to the 1,000-foot, proposed 1,000-foot distance set off from public housing. And I didn't know if our city attorney could address, is this because, again, we're trying to stay consistent with federal regulations, or is it just a number that came out of somebody? <laughs> Councillor Benares, yes, that's correct. It's part of the Drug-Free School Zone Act. So the question is, I'll just pose it. I move to amend the engrossed ordinance bill number 17-14 by um, modifying section 31-.090B3D and uh, move the distance from 1,000 foot to 500 foot. This one moved by Councillor Benares and seconded by Councillor Dickey. Is there discussion, Councillor Benares, I, to your I motion? I just wondered why, I guess, I understand the reason if it follows parallel to some of the federal regulations. My issue there was um, why public housing has any preference over, over residential zones throughout the city, which we're setting down at 100 foot. As long as it's on Ontario and as long as it's, it's on a correctly zone and it fits all the other requirements that we've put together, I don't understand necessarily, other than consistency, mm -hmm. why we should move it any, any different. It, maybe it shouldn't even be 500, it should be 100. Any further discussion? All right, the question on the floor, the motion by Councillor Benares and seconded by Councillor Dickey to <laughs> to reduce the uh, number of feet from public housing from 1,000 to 500. Councillor Nanke. 
Is this any property owned by the Salem Housing Authority, a duplex, a single family residential? Um, it is a housing facility, which is not defined in federal law. We've defined that to mean a, a, a multi-unit development, not a single scattered site duplex. And not specific as to if it's a senior only facility? If it's administered by the housing authority. Okay. Councilor Bernard. That does bring up a, a, an interesting question. Public housing, does that also define those individuals who are in Section 8? So if you have a, say, a family living in a, a single family residence in a neighborhood? As I uh, just mentioned, Councilor, it only applies to a facility, a multifamily facility, not a scattered site, duplex, okay, single family you. house. All right, question on the floor. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion nay. carries. Nay. I'm sorry. Councilor Clem? Nay. Voted no. Okay. Thanks. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilor Ben. Madam Mayor, I move we extend uh, the council time to 1030. Is there a second? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. But you know, the deal is if, you'll ta if we talk faster, we can leave earlier under this plan. So. All right. All right. Is there a second to the motion? Yes. Tessler. All right. Moved by, by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Tesler to, um, to extend the meeting for 30 minutes to 1030. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, Councillor Tesler. Um, I, I just wanted to say one thing before we left this, and I, I just wanted to tell the police how much I really appreciate the police. Um, I don't want you to walk out of here and think that I don't appreciate you because that is not true. And you have helped so many people in my ward that I can't even count how many times you have. And if I have asked for anything, they have been there. And I don't want anybody to think that I have a problem with these folks, because I don't. And they do a great job. And I really like the little alerts that you've been sending out, yeah, the little yeah, email alerts. If you don't get these email alerts, you should, because every time something goes down, you know about it. And this guy, they caught that guy that hit the guy on the bike, the hit and run this weekend, which was just excellent. I mean, we were high-fiving each other around the campfire. I mean, that is cool. So, yay! So, I just wanted you guys, and what does it say on the back of your car? It says, serve, what does it say? I took a picture of it. Service, pride, dedication. That's right. Okay? So, I, don't, I just don't want people to walk out of here and think that, that we don't respect them and what they do. But sometimes we just need to fine-tune stuff, and that's what happened tonight. Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor, I have a question uh, yes. for the city attorney on one item that came up this evening, which was the uh, uh, discussion of the October 27th dates relationship oh, yeah. to the January 1st annual renewal date to, to try to kind of understand how that all fits together. Thank you, Councillor. If you look at 31025, um, it says license term and renewal. Um, Section A states the license shall be valid from the date of issuance for a period of one year. Um, I think where the confusion is lying is that the, there's a definition for, definition for annual um, in the code, which was actually pulled from SRC 30, which talks about uh, annual meaning January 1 to December 31st. So um, I can see where the confusion is, but the, essentially the license will be issued for a period of one year, whatever date it's issued on. So if it was issued on October 28th, it's good till October 27th the next year. Okay. But does that create a, I wonder about the workload as the police look at this in terms of cost, if you have, uh, or and uh, community, if you have this floating renewal date, does that ever cause problems? It doesn't for DMV, but there you just take a number and, <laughs> and stand in line. I don't know how it works. No, I, th I think that's the appropriate way to do it, that do the license okay. is good for a year. So we yeah. need to get that January yeah. 
number fixed. Is that correct? Well, I, I think the easiest solutions. I'll, I'll, I'll review the rest of the code it? just to be sure. But I think as long as we just um, eliminate that definition for annual from the, the draft, that'll do it. Because I don't believe annual is actually used in the rest of the code. So. Yeah. Does anyone feel like we need to have a motion to that? If, are you comfortable he can just fix that? It's a Scrivener's error. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. May, may I ask a question, Mayor? Yes, certainly. I want to make sure I understand. Um, all of the um, licenses coming at one time might be a bigger load for us to handle than if they come uh, right. when they expire. Right. Uh, so I didn't. I wasn't sure if that is exactly what the councilor was asking. That I, I was asking, and I was told to, that the manager gave me the indication that the best so, thing to do so is rotating. So if someone comes in on August or October 28th, then it's due October 27th of the following year. If someone right. comes in that's in January right. 1st of 15, that, that's exactly it's due what we December prefer. 31st yep. yeah. the next year. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Councilor Benars. Thank you. This is the last one. And it's not a motion at the moment. Um, I just wanted to have a, a conversation in reference to the, and I couldn't find it. I have read this thing and read this thing. But it has to do with the, the difference of misdemeanor versus uh, felony offenses, those that are allowed to have a license or work in a facility. Uh, and I thought it would be important that we have that discussion here. I, I'm, I'm not up on the legal side of exactly what a felony is and what exactly a misdemeanor is, but does that mean if I get a parking ticket and I don't pay it, all of a sudden I'm in that category? <laughs> Turn it over. <laughs> no, I, Jim Ferrer's deputy police chief. Um, no, Councillor, that's not not what that means. Um, the misdemeanor offenses that we're that we're talking about are things like frequenting a place where drugs are used or sold. That's a Class A misdemeanor. Um, some possession and, and delivery charges of certain schedules of drugs, Schedule 3, 4, and 5 on the federal schedule oftentimes are misdemeanors. So those are the kinds of misdemeanors that we're talking about. Um, the ones that, that are not punishable by a sentence to a penitentiary. A felony is a, is, a, uh, is a crime that's punishable by greater than a year in jail or to the penitentiary, misdemeanor uh, less than a year. So that's what we're talking about. So then, then I'll take that a step further. We talked about misdemeanors that pertain to drug-related crimes as opposed to misdemeanors that relate to Whatever exactly. Drug-related misdemeanors, not a not a misdemeanor for shoplifting, or not a misdemeanor for so that some is in other there. That's in there. That just says it's drug-related. I yeah. can go with that. Okay. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Missed it. <laughs> All right. We're going to move ahead, and our next item is on the main motion. All right. Our next. It's the main motion. Councillor Nanke. Yeah, I just had a question on one other item mm -hmm. for okay. clarification. It is uh, 31.085. J in regards to a standards of operation. In regarding that the facility must utilize an air filtration and ventilation system that confines all odors associated with the facility to the facility premises. I visited one of these locations. There was a faint aroma of green um, raw vegetation marijuana <laughs> if you want to call it that way well, how and how will this be enforced I mean are we gonna circle the place and smell or people are gonna just have to put in a piece of equipment that they really don't need because we say you have to have some kind of air filtration system I, I can address it. Um, the idea is that one of the most common complaints that uh, neighbors of uh, dispensaries and facilities have is that there is an emanating odor of marijuana. The idea is to require them to have an air filtration system that contains that odor within the pre premises. It, is that complaint associated with the smoking thereof or the raw material? The raw material. And generally, those types of complaints are or those types of issues are dealt with on a complaint basis. So if somebody complains, then we would inspect it. 
Well. But, I mean, we're putting this into where to get your license, I will have to show you that I have an air filtration system installed in my building, will it not? Yeah. Councilor Bennett? Yeah, I, I, I had asked about this, too, at one point, and one of the things I understood, because this I've had this complaint in my ward several times over a long period of time where a person with a business has a smoke shop move in next door and really uh, affected their business very negatively and uh, it, it was it was the smoke it was and and one of the things is that folks who work at these places also may well be patients and may well be smoking and we're not and we really can't have them walking it, into a room that is unfiltered where this is coming out to any business next door to that that really doesn't work that creates a problem that nobody wants I, I, I really think this is one that we really should leave alone uh, you know you could you could say these people can only treat their their illness with edibles or oils but I I'm just real uncomfortable that we would have one that does not protect the nearby public nearby businesses from the smoke but there will be no smoke in this yes there will they oh, are really? allowed to use they are patients I well yeah, I'm Moore not won. going for any of this with I think Chief Moore has a comment one. chief well I think it is allowed if if the person working in a in a dispensary uh, is a medical marijuana patient they're allowed to smoke marijuana uh, yeah, while I, on site. Yeah, this is not with, with filtration, is which is the, no. the situation, and I really think we need to deal with this thing. I'd, I'd leave this one alone. This thing starts to fall apart real quick. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bennett, uh, excuse me, Councillor Clem. I, I completely concur with Councillor Bennett. I think for now it, it, it makes sense that if the facilities require filtration so they, they yeah. don't impact other businesses or. Uh, shoppers of other businesses I, I think we leave this one alone and then you know if it if it becomes untenable then we address it but i, I agree with councilor bennett completely chief moore well i'll just say uh, i i wasn't even thinking of the people that were smoking when this uh, ventilation was actually created i can tell you that the number one complainers in the city of salem that i'm aware of uh, are people in City Hall when the police department brings in a, a load of uh, <laughs> marijuana into the, because uh, quite frankly, uh, yes, it, it goes through the, the system and uh, everyone in the entire complex can, can smell it. Now, I don't have this confirmed, but I've been told that there is a, uh, one of the businesses near one of the, next, that abuts one of the uh, f uh, marijuana facilities um, is planning on moving their operation simply because of the, the smell of the odor of the marijuana. And I'm not going to tell you that's factual at this point, but, uh, but I've heard that from, from people. And then as uh, our city attorney indicated, that is one of the biggest complaints, I believe, uh, in some of the other cities where uh, marijuana is legal and abundant. Mm -hmm. Councilor Benares. Well, thank you, uh, Police Chief Jerry Moore, because I was going to mention the same thing as I had visited toward the, the police department, opening the door to the, the room that stores many of the drugs that uh, are confiscated. Oh, it's an incredible smell that you don't want to really be around. Um, actually, I was going to ask, is there empirical measurements that we could go off of if somebody has a, a device or something that, can, that, that I don't know what the particulates are, but is there any way to measure it at all? I'm, so, I'm sorry, to measure what? To, to measure the aroma smell. Oh. I mean, is there a, a no, standard? No, is there I a, think it's uh, probably a reasonable. Pot yeah. sniffer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have an after. I'm going so, to. Op, I, I'm so, just. I'm just going to exercise the chair's prerogative yeah, okay. here for a moment because actually we are gobbling up time that uh, we tried to set aside so we could move on to some of the other things on the agenda. So. If you'll be patient with me, I want to run us through this agenda before we all fall asleep. All right. We are now at item 8.1B. Oh, we have to go back to the main motion again. Yes. All right. And the main motion was made, I believe, by Councillor Bennett. Councillor Bennett, would you like to repeat your motion just well, my, for the record? My motion was originally the staff recommendation, which has been substantially amended. All right. And we've all been through the amendments. 
And the second was by Councillor Clem. All right, it's been moved by Councillor Bennett, seconded by Councillor Clem. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, now. <laughs> 8.1B, amendment to the Salem Revised Code, Chapter 102. Would the recorder like to introduce the motion, the this will be ordinance? My, this will be my final um, first reading of ordinance oh. for the city of Salem. Oh. <laughs> ordinance Bill Number 2014, relating to the Downtown Parking District, amending SRC 102.045, 102.055, and 102.065, creating new provisions and declaring an emergency. Thank you. Councillor Bennett, do you have a motion? I do, Madam Mayor. I move, I move we advance ordinance bill number 2014, amending, amending the Salem Revised Code Chapter 102 to second reading for enactment. Second. second. It's been moved by Councillor Bennett and seconded by Councillor Benars and Tesler. <laughs> Councillor Bennett, would you like to speak to your motion? No, thank you, Madam you Mayor. Change the hours of enforcement. Yeah, I do. I make a motion. No. Okay. I just go ahead. And no. It's all about parking. It's all about parking. <laughs> it's, all about parking. <laughs> it's all about parking. I was going to do something Would about you like the to hours. Speak? Yes. You're welcome to have my time. All right. Then I would offer a substitute motion to um, amend the motion so as to allow for uh, different hours and in fact to extend the hours uh, until um, nine o'clock, did we say nine, nine or 10? Nine o'clock p.m. So it would be from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Oh, and Mayor, I think we, we had about? asked uh, Mr. Wells to uh, look at the actual enforcement hours mm -hmm. and staffing and yeah. come back with something. Mr. Sure. Wells, do you have information? Sure. Okay. Um, the, the, the section, I believe, um, um, Madam Mayor, that you're referring to mm -hmm. is um, in the, the section in section 102045, uh, section E, as in uh, England. Um, to put the time limits that currently are enforcing, and this is primarily for employee parking on the streets, um, it's currently at from 10, um, uh, it, it, it's from, um, I'm sorry, it's from currently at 10 a.m. to 8. 10, 10 a.m. to 8 a.m. to put it back to the pre-petition um, time period when um, we had time limits on the street um, back to 8 to 7. And I think you're asking to extend it, put it back to eight, starting at eight in the morning, but keeping it at eight at night, if that was, I understand your No, your nine o'clock at night. Nine o'clock at night. Yeah. Right, and so that's item 102.045, item E. So it would be amending that item from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. P.m. And that, um, that is an increase of, of several hours uh, every day for the, the staff that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, we think we could adjust, um, at least through the holidays, some, um, some a, a adjustment on our allocation of the staff. But going much longer than that, I think it's gonna have an impact uh, to our budget and to our staffing. So I think for, the, for this time period, since this is a temporary um, um, solution that we're looking at through, the, through January, um, I, we've talked with our parking enforcement, and they think that they can adjust, but this isn't, wouldn't be a long-term solution for our parking resources. No, but isn't this... This is temporary. This is just temporary. It, it, it was designed right. that way. And, and, and that's what I'm just making that point, that we'd hope that this is understood and remember that this is for a temporary situation, not, not a long-term or permanent. My motion is just for to adjust this, which is temporary. But are you saying that if we make a decision on that this evening, that that binds us from later extending that time? Uh, no, I'll let, I'll this see. this does change the code. It's a permanent change until you change the code later. The the three hour parking limit is going to be set by administrative order, mm -hmm. and it'll be enforced pursuant to the hours in the code. So this section is indefinite until you change it by another code amendment. So I think what um, Director Wales is saying is that as far as a staffing measure and the cost of his resources, he can do it on a temporary basis, but going forward when the 
when the holidays are over, you may need to look at changing it again. Yeah. Or devoting more money to parking enforcement. Okay. I have a question. Hang on. So, so to, to clarify that, there's going to be an administrative order. If this if this ordinance is is adopted, there'll be an administrative order that establishes three hour time limit on a temporary basis. At that point, we'll bring back a report to you to let you know how it went, and then you can make changes as you see fit. Good. All right, Councillor Bennett. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I really uh, I support your amendment uh, and, and hope even in the future as we look at resources we could go later because what happens is you go back three hours from the time and that's when enforcement literally stops. Yeah, well, and it, if it's seven, it's four. Uh, this will at least get us to six. So we down particularly in the restaurant areas that means they just fill up with people parking for the night yeah, uh, whether they work there the whole evening and the night or they live there and the result is again we end up with this uh, everybody hooked together it didn't work at two hours it won't work at three if we don't move this thing out in time and i think we're just gonna have to kind of bite the bullet and figure out the resources or this parking stuff has real troubles in the evening down there. Mm -hmm. it, does. it definitely does. Uh, Councillor Clem and then Councillor Benars. Madam Mayor, thank you. I, I just want to clarify, is this the part of the code where it just um, says the following persons may not park downtown? It's only that part of the code that we're amending? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, so it's only related to students, employees, it isn't all parkers. This uh, 045E only speaks to those who are restricted from parking downtown. I'm, I'm trying to, I guess I'm asking the city attorney, is that the section that's being amended? No. I, I don't know that. See, that's, that's my concern. I, I get that you want to go till 9 so we can at least enforce till 6, but that's all parking. This particular section only deals with the folks who are prohibited from parking downtown. Help me understand, Dan. So if you wanted to prohibit all persons or if you wanted to ex extend the three-hour limit to all persons, that will be part of the administrative order. If you want us to enforce that, we can set a certain number of hours for that. It will be enforced from 8 to... 8 to 9 p.m. That's not a problem. That can be an administrative order. Okay. Okay. So that's the what we're doing, effect it? of this motion is is all persons, or it's only those who are prohibited. Well, this motion only affects the 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 certain class of the citizens who are classes. prohibited from parking. So, um, as I understand it, your desire is to prohibit all person to subject all persons to the time limit. Correct, the three hour time limit. So we can do that as part of the administrative order. We don't need you to do this motion to amend the hours. That's of why I say I'm not sure this However, motion's needed. Is necessary. I, th I think there's an additional cost to doing that because the signs that we're putting up has that time That's limit changing. for all people, for the, the customers of um, it's nine to six. And this is, this is, um, the attorney is correct that what this motion is speaking directly to is just those individuals that are not. That's right. But yeah. So, I beg to differ. I thought as we worked through this, when the uh, downtown uh, business owners and managers came to us, we, they were talking about all parkers and in favor of a three hour time limit and in favor of, of time restrictions. And I don't remember any discussion about just focusing on employees, students, and residents. I thought this three-hour extension and whatever else we were doing for the holiday period of time would apply equally to all parkers. Right. Maybe, maybe if I can try to clarify. So the three-hour okay. time limits would be would put up signs that say two-hour limits once per day you know per block face so anyone would do it for three hours but mm -hmm. if you read the language here of the part you're amending e says except when authorized by a valid parking permit the following persons may not park a motor vehicle in downtown parking district 
in any on-street parking zone in an off-street parking facility between the hours, and this was gonna be changed 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. except Sundays and holidays. And the following persons are a student, a person working in his or her place of employment, um, a person engaged in the conduct of his or her own business, his or her own business. But I think what you want to do, Mayor, is not necessarily amend that part, but you want to give us direction that uh, when we do the three hours, it's not just between, then it's any time. Is that correct? Oh. Until, so the, I think we have two so time to, So there's a couple issues going on. First is that the signs that are already made up, that were previously made up, <laughs> say nine to six. Correct. That's correct. So for for, pe for customer people parking downtown. So those yeah. those that applies to everyone, whether they're a customer, a business owner, a student, whatever it is, they have that three hour limit. <laughs> so we can't really change those hours of operation easily unless you want to order brand new signs, and that's a huge cost. So the hours of enforcement for that three hour limit are going to be as stated in the sign, and the sign says nine to six. That's right. Which kind of covers the evening issue you were talking about. Mr. Clem. Madam Mayor, I, I, I enjoin with you that uh, we should go till 9 mm -hmm. and 6 o'clock. If the sign says 6 o'clock now, let's just leave it alone. But I think this part of the code, the amendment here says 7 p.m. and it should state 9 p.m. So I support your motion. Mm -hmm. I think the administrative order makes it very clear that it, the three hour limit is for everybody. So I think the motion's fine. I just want to make sure we know what we're doing here, and that is that we're just only addressing students and employees. But I think the administrative order and the motion passed earlier by council makes it clear that it's a three-hour limit for everybody. This would just be a, a, a correction to the one exception of talking about students and employees. So I support the motion. I think we should vote on it and leave the signs the way they are. They say 6 p.m. now. That's the intent of your motion is to go till 9 o'clock, back it up by 3. The signs are fine. Let's don't change the signs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dickey and then Councillor Clausen. Yeah, I have a question about the signage. Um, can't we just get the decals that go over? You don't have to put brand new signs. You can just put the decals over. That's not extremely expensive. That, that's the intent, Councillor. Yes, we're going to put a three over the two. But on the bottom of the signs, that it, it does reference the hours of enforcement. I think the question is, can we put a nine over the six. Nine. Oh, yeah. nine over the <laughs> <laughs> I think that doesn't cost a lot to do that. I don't think it does. <laughs> Councillor Clausen. Thank you. Uh, to clarify what Councillor Clem was saying, at least in my understanding, I think the issue is that if it says six o'clock now, which means our parking authority people are going home at 301 because it's a three hour limit. So if somebody parks at 301, they cannot get a ticket. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And that is the bulk shopping time from 3 o'clock till 8 o'clock because people are getting off of work. So I, if I understand the mayor's motion, the intent is to try to continue the three-hour parking through that bulk shopping period after work. So that would mean we'd need to change the sign to say for people parking till 9 p.m. So then at 6.01, the parking enforcement is packing up and heading home. If I'm understanding that right, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with Councillor Clausen. Councilor this signs can be changed with the decal, correct? Yeah. 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 We'll there's support there's your some <laughs> small additional cost. I don't know what that is off the top of my head. Mr. Wells, what are the parking enforcement hours right now? Sorry, the parking enforcement staff, what hours do they work? Well, they, they're on a range. They're on a schedule, yeah. and they come in at different times during the day. And they're not all, we've got eight enforcement officers for the entire city. Um, and four typically, three to four typically dedicated to downtown. We're looking to, as going back to time limits, we may have to increase that um, in the downtown. But that's six days a week. Um, and we're talking about being in operation here, um, you know, having coverage for um, substantially more than what we have staff for right now. So we would need to bring, likely bring on extra uh, staff or, right. or contracts for contractors for the season. The, the, the cost isn't hires. going to be the decals. The cost is going to be stretching that much, that few staff over this many hours. If I may, 
I chose Council a poor. Clausen. I chose a poor illustration. They're not leaving at yeah. 301. Yeah. No, they're, <laughs> they're still there enforcing the rest of the code. They out. quit <laughs> ticketing for that person who parked at 301. They're not going to get a ticket that's a, because that's a, they're there and they could park from 301 till 8 a.m. the next morning and it doesn't matter. Right. And I think they do. <laughs> yeah, and they do. <laughs> And I think the nice thing would be to keep forcing that circulation until 601, at which point then they could park from 601 through the evening. Well, I, I want to speak to my motion because my intent is not to provide a system that's convenient financially or staffing wise for the city of Salem on this temporary parking time. This is to provide the shoppers, the people who come downtown, particularly during this holiday period of time, with the very best parking experience they can possibly have. And when they come downtown at 6.25 p.m. to have dinner and do some shopping, and all the spaces are filled by residents and employees, then where are they supposed to get this great, shot, this great parking experience? It's not going to be our downtown. So I thought what we were trying to do with this motion was to provide a longer period of time that the spaces would be monitored yes. so that indeed there would be the turnover so that our restaurants and our shops that we want to have open in the evening could actually have the customers that they need. And Mayor, if I can, uh, what we could do, because this is the first reading, is we just don't want to surprise you with additional costs. So we could bring back for the second reading what that additional amount would be and our recommendations for how we fund that. Yeah, that's great. All right. That work? Yeah. All right. So then the motion, as amended, is to extend the uh, parking time restriction from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, Councillor Benars. I am going to make a motion to extend the meeting until 10, no, or yeah, it would be 1040. Second. All right. 10 more minutes. It's been moved by Councillor Benars and, and seconded by Councillor Clausen to extend our meeting time until 1040. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion carries with Start Councillor Nanke voting no. Start the All right. We're back to the motion on the floor. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Thank you. Motion carries, passes unanimously. All right. We have no second readings this evening. We have time for public comment. I believe we have someone signed up for public comment tonight. Yes, I see. Tim Cowan followed by Ken Hetzel. Thank you. Good evening. I always thank people who wait this long for their perseverance. Mayor, council members, my blood sugar is really low, so I got to do this quick because I see the kick over there. You have my <laughs> okay. testimony. It's one page. I'll go over it real quick. Um, oh, thank you. If we negotiate where all parties receive more than what they thought possible, your decision would not have received a notice or an intent for appeal. I'm neither for nor against the issue at hand. I can't make a decision without knowing what my options are. If you in a hospital were not interested in the best outcome, you did not have the time to identify the parties involved, what they wanted, why, and creating options. As a result, you have created groups as opposed to bringing the community together. Right now, I'm, I'm dealing with about four different groups, just talking to them and trying to find out what position they, they're taking. In the hospital representative at the SCAN meeting, which was kind of interesting, talked about why the hospital, they wouldn't budge, and one of the comments they made was because they make money. One of the things I have an issue with is they put a fence around Howard Hall. How does a notice, how does the public receive notice of the meeting when it's a small little notice on the other side of the fence? The, the important question for me is, what's the purpose of the Historic Landmarks Commission? And why was the decision overturned? Because my issue when I talk about, like I addressed in my 
um, letter to the editor is I don't want the historic area of the capital which represents the, the, uh, the state of Oregon, the heritage of the state of Oregon, to be vulnerable to changes in the mayor or the city council. So in the 40 years I've been around Salem, oh, <laughs> that, the last one, uh, Kurt, I believe, was a person who talked about uh, SCAN. I felt that the questions and the way he was, he was treated was not consistent with my image of who you are, because I hold you in very high esteem. Now, the last thing is I'm going to have to make a decision in about one or two days on wh whether I'm going to support and I will volunteer to negotiate, but I will have to make a decision on which side of the, the equation I'm going to support. And I want you to know that. Fair enough? Can I have a piece of cake now? Thank you very much. Actually, I think our city just, attorney has this a This is not for Mr. Callum, but just a, a quick note to council that the Howard Hall decision was appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals. so. It is still a pending quasi-judicial matter, so you need to refrain from ex-party contacts regarding the Howard Hall decision. Okay. All right. That's not me. That's right. not you. Okay. Let you eat cake. Thank you. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> Thank you again for waiting. Well, anyone who speaks to us in regards to marriage is ex-party. Madam Mayor. Ken Hetzel, welcome. Madam Mayor and Councilman, <laughs> I'd like to take a minute to answer Councillor Clem's question about communication from the SCAN Neighborhood Association to the people. Jim Eglin brought us nextdoor.com. We divided the SCAN neighborhood into Fairmont, about 300 houses. McKinley is south of rural, and Bush Park is north of rural and east of commercial. And in Fairmont Park, we have 80% participation, all the homes there. We can send out an email or a text, and 80% of the people get it on their smartphones instantly and stuff. So we use nextdoor.com. So then the public comment, my name is Kenneth Hetzel, and I'm moving into 745 Harris Street. Mm. And I came two meetings ago and asked for $200 for Rock to have the hands across the bridge and the city manager facilitated it and Councilman Bennett sponsored it and he told me that y'all approved it. I haven't seen the check, but I personally want to thank you. We had a hell of a party. I don't know how many people came. It was a crowd. We had 20 providers. I apologize to Councilman Dickey. Her day job is smoke sensation for Marion County. She said she couldn't come, but she could give me all the brochures I wanted, and I didn't go by and get them. I apologize. And I didn't get the dare car from the police chief. I tried to get that. Recovery is hard. I'm in recovery. In the 1990s, I was a public accountant. I had a wife and daughter and two step boys. In 96, I had a mental health moment. I became homeless. I was homeless till July of this year. You know, I've been on the scan board for five years and I've been homeless because I live with my daughter mm -hmm. in inadequate housing. Recovery is a process, a step that takes a long time. And except for the grace of God, any of y'all could be homeless. There was a lady sleeping in the middle of our party because she gets up and walks all night long in the city to protect herself. And she chooses to do that. You know, God made her that way. Let her be that way. You know, don't hurt people. You're, the mayor's going to propose a thing to not smoke on city right away. Except for the grace of God, you don't have the habit. You don't have the habit of smoking or doping or drugging or drinking just because God picked you. But don't kick the people that are hurting. They're doing the best they can. They need people like me and other people in recovery to show them the road of how to get out. We can get out. 
you know, it takes time, long time, from 1996 to now. That's 18 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony, and I celebrate your sobriety. Cheers for you. And thank you again also for your service on the scan board. We appreciate that so much. All right. We're moving to actually mayor's items. I have two items on the agenda, 10.1A, announcing appointments to the Airport Advisory Commission, the Historic Landmarks Commission, the Social Service Advisory Board, and the Human Rights and Relations Advisory Commission. There is a memo in your uh, agenda that does itemize uh, those um, commissions, and it actually also does um, indicate the names of the people who have been uh, appointed, and I want to read those names for the recognition and thank you to those individuals, to the Airport Advisory Commission, Randall Ierson, to the Historic Landmarks Commission is Nicholas Larson, the Social Service Advisory Board is Arturo Vargas, and the Human Rights and Relations Advisory Commission is Nateen Carr. Am I saying that correctly? Does staff know exactly how to say that name? Okay. Not a good uh, guess on my part. The last name is spelled K-A-U-R. I appreciate so much when citizens are willing, when residents are willing to serve on our boards and commissions, and I thank those individuals. So I want that um, announcement to council. And my next item is, I do have a motion to bring forward to you. Do I need a motion to accept those appointments, by no. the way? No, I didn't no. think so. OK. Yeah. So my motion um, is item 10.1B. And it has to do with prohibiting smoking on city-owned rights-of-way. And I move to direct staff to schedule a public hearing and bring back an ordinance prohibiting smoking on public sidewalks adjacent to property that has been designated as a non-smoking property by the property owner. Second. And thank you. It's, I, it's been moved by me and seconded by Councillor Dickey. I'll speak to my motion. We have been requested by um, some individual, some businesses that properties that do have um, non-smoking rules that govern their properties, and so that's the um, in response to their request, the uh, staff will come back with a uh, with an ordinance, and we'll actually have a public hearing on that. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Other questions? All right. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Aye. Motion carries, and the no was Councillor Nanke. Thank you very much. All right. I believe we have no councillor's items, and we are adjourned. Thank you.